Welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of CMC Microsystems, uh, I welcome you to this event. This is a pretty exciting day for us as we organize our second uh, Accelerating AI workshop. And we are really thrilled uh, that you took the time out of your busy schedule to spend it here with us and to learn and explore and interact with leaders from industry and academia on the latest challenges and opportunities of AI acceleration in the cloud and at the edge. Also, a big thanks to our distinguished speakers uh, for accepting the invitation uh, to share with us uh, what they are working on. Okay, so my name is Yasin. I work for uh, CMC Microsystem. It's an organization I'll talk uh, about in a bit. And currently, uh, I'm leading projects and activities that assess, uh, develop, deliver, and support infrastructure, enabling research and development in AI, ML, and embedded systems. <clears throat> so, just a, a flashback uh, before presenting the objectives of this workshop. Uh, uh, let's take a look at the first Accelerating AI workshop, uh, which was organized last year, and it was an in-person event uh, in two locations, Ecole Polytechnique of Montreal and the uh, University of Toronto. And these were really a very successful event, well attended with a very, uh, in very good uh, panel session. And we are running uh, this one virtually due to uh, COVID uh, circumstances and global pandemic. And we really hope to see you all uh, in person next year uh, for the third workshop. So we're hoping to uh, have this uh, annual event uh, organized every year uh, to, to, to share with you uh, the latest developments in the space of AI acceleration. Uh, so let's look at the objectives. Uh, today we are going to uh, cover AI accelerations from uh, different perspectives and we would like to uh, to share with you the latest trends and innovations uh, and uh, hopefully identify uh, some of the challenges and opportunities in uh, cloud and edge computing, explore collaboration opportunities uh, and identify uh, common infrastructure requirements uh, that will uh, help CMC uh, improve and enhance uh, its infrastructure in this space. Uh, we have a very exciting uh, agenda today, uh, speakers from industry, academia, not profit, uh, uh, discussing uh, different uh, uh, aspects related to AI acceleration. We have a presentation uh, from uh, Dr. Quan Wang from Huawei. Uh, he will be uh, talking a little bit about the latest development uh, from Huawei. Uh, a unique uh, accelerator for AI, and uh, he will be talking about uh, the architecture as well as its software stack. We have Griffin Lacey from NVIDIA. He will share with us uh, the latest developments from NVIDIA and uh, how uh, they help researchers and uh, industry around the world in accelerating that data science on GPUs and some of the latest developments on uh, the open source uh, that uh, NVIDIA is working on. Uh, Davis uh, is a co-founder of Deep Light and he will be uh, discussing the optimization technologies and the compression of deep neural network to make them uh, very efficient and very fast uh, on edge devices. Mohamed, he will be uh, discussing uh, a barrel risk 5 processor for AI acceleration. Uh, George Shaker, uh, Professor George will be uh, discussing some of the advanced uh, advances in sensing using AI uh, and low uh, cost radar. Uh, Professor Paul Chow from University of Toronto, he will be discussing a heterogeneous platform uh, for large scale uh, machine learning. And this is an ongoing project he's working on uh, for several years. So we are really excited to hear about uh, his latest development in this space. And Pavel, he will be uh, discussing and presenting a low power AI system. And uh, least but, but, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, our friend Rick O'Connor from Open Hardware Group. He will be presenting some of the latest uh, updates from Open Hardware Group on core five uh, cores uh, technologies. And we will uh, hopefully uh, conclude the session with, uh, with an open uh, panel session where we will discuss these challenges and opportunities and take some questions from the floor. So just a little bit about CMC. Uh, CMC is a uh, not-for-profit uh, incorporated in 1984, and uh, we manage what we call the Canada National Design Network, uh, which is a uh, collaborative project in, in uh, collaboration uh, in, in Canada. And uh, we are headquartered in Montreal and offices uh, in Ottawa and Kingston. So our mission is really to facilitate access to state-of-the-art uh, design and manufacturing and testing facilities of microsystem technologies 
uh, by providing an infrastructure for innovation and uh, lowering barriers and simplifying access to different technologies, including microelectronics, uh, photonics, uh, MEMS, nanofabrication, AI machine learning, and quantum technologies. <clears throat> So as I said, uh, Canada uh, CNDN or uh, the Canada National Design Network is a collaboration between 67 universities and colleges to connect 10,000 academic participants with over 1,000 companies. And the main mission is really to help uh, uh, design, make and test a microsystem uh, prototype. Uh, we measure outcome annually by the number of publications, awards, patents awarded, collaboration with industry, new startups, and trained HQP that move to industry. <clears throat> and we offer our products and services uh, under three banners, uh, CAD, Fab, and Lab. Uh, CAD consists of uh, state-of-the-art uh, software uh, for successful design. These are CAD tools that are hosted in the cloud or can be installed uh, locally. Uh, and uh, we offer this with uh, user guides, process design kits, PDKs, and application notes and training material and courses. As for FAB, it uh, consists of multi-project wafer uh, services through uh, global supply chains. We offer fabrication services uh, in microelectronics down to 12 nanometer, and the fabrication services for silicon photonics, uh, MEMS, nanofabrication and packaging and assembly services. Uh, as for lab, uh, this consists of tools uh, for uh, test and demonstration, which include uh, platform technologies uh, to speed all your research, test equipment loans, uh, technical uh, contract services, including uh, help from our uh, quantum uh, scientists uh, to help you uh, code in your uh, next uh, quantum algorithms and accelerating it in a quantum computer, constructing research networks and international uh, partnership uh, for unique needs. <clears throat> and this is made possible uh, by uh, leveraging uh, our world industrial supply chains uh, to enable uh, research and innovation in this space. So here I would like to uh, in, to start this workshop uh, by, uh, by presenting some of the most important key trends uh, of accelerating AI and hopefully uh, set the stage for the rest of the presentation today. So this is a very high level introduction, uh, AI, ML, and DL in one slide. As you know, AI, AI uh, consists uh, of uh, mimicking and developing and demonstrating human behavior. And uh, ML is a subset of AI, which consists of algorithms based on statistical models that improve uh, as they are exposed to new data. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning, uh, which really consists of multi-layer uh, deep neural network uh, that learn from vast amount of data. So AI as a field is not new. It's been around for many, many decades, uh, but it became so popular uh, for the last decade because of the advancements in especially deep learning. So let's take a look at some of the key enablers of uh, deep learning. You have, first of all, a large amount of data available to train this deep neural network. Uh, also, uh, the, uh, these uh, deep neural networks such as CNN and uh, other deep neural networks, they are very compute intensive. So the availability of uh, high performance computing accelerators really helped uh, kick off the field. So GPUs, TPUs, FPGAs, and we witnessed a lot of algorithmic innovation as well from uh, uh, the community by uh, introducing new models, doing different things and very, very good and frameworks such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, which make it very easy to now to train and deploy a deep neural network uh, for a particular application. Strong community by the number of publications and really huge investments. So this uh, machine learning space has led to many subfield, including supervised learning, unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning, reinforcement learning, and this really to tackle different type of problems. Uh, but overall, uh, these techniques, uh, this uh, new uh, innovation in the field uh, has led to new techniques, uh, which are used in new applications and are deployed in different products uh, that really uh, changed our life uh, in many ways. Uh, so in the cloud and at the edge in particular. So since the, the workshop is about AI acceleration, let's take a quick look at, uh, uh, at the, uh, the, uh, the computing uh, uh, evolution. So basically, uh, OpenAI doing a great job by uh, plotting this, uh, this uh, graph because they show really uh, the transition from a first era uh, where uh, the, uh, from 1960 to 2012, 
where the compute usage uh, roughly uh, track Moore's law. <clears throat> And the modern era uh, from 2012 to now of results uh, using computational power that uh, really substantially uh, outpace uh, global trends. So if we look at uh, the, this era, the new era for the last uh, decade, uh, we can see why we really need the better AI hardware. Uh, from this graph uh, that showed uh, the performance uh, for each uh, deep neural network, the performance has really gone exponential. So from <clears throat> AlexNet, which was introduced in 2012 and which won the ImageNet competition, to AlphaGo Zero, which was able to defeat the world champions in Go. So from AlexNet to AlphaGo Zero, uh, we had to increase the level of performance by 300,000 X. And if we followed Moore's law in the span of, the, of this period, uh, we could have obtained the only 10 X in, in gain. So we really need to bridge the gap between the level of performance that deep neural network needs in the future and the level of performance that we uh, could have obtained from Moore's law. And this is really by uh, innovating around all the software and the hardware stack, especially introducing new custom hardware to deal with new type of deep neural network. So uh, just to give a very high level overview about the uh, AI hardware in two by two X matrix, as you know, the, uh, the, the deep learning or machine learning is two phases that you need to train your network on a particular set of data. And the second step is inference and, and the tr training uh, mostly happen in the cloud. So maybe 99.99% .99 happen in the cloud because of the availability of high end uh, uh, AI accelerators from GPUs, TPUs and custom accelerators and inference. There is still a lot of services that you use every day that are in the cloud. Uh, but uh, a hot topic uh, is uh, that uh, AI is, uh, is uh, increasingly moving to the edge for many advantages. And these advantages include uh, bandwidth, uh, connectivity, uh, privacy, and latency. So for many applications, it really makes sense to move this application, AI application to the edge because you are close to the sensor and therefore uh, you can process data close to the sensor and uh, it offer you a lot of these advantages. <clears throat> but this is not free, it comes at a cost. So you need a high computational complexity, a very small uh, memory, footprint and extremely low power consumption to be able to deploy these at the edge. And this uh, statistics and prediction from uh, uh, ABI research confirmed that uh, uh, for, for, for example, uh, by 2023, more than half of the devices, uh, more than half the percent of the devices, they will be AI enabled. And this trend is to continue. So there will be a lot of adoption of AI at the edge in the future. And by 2024, it will exceed 60%. So now, uh, since I give a very high introduction of uh, the, this workshop, I would like to give you a very uh, brief uh, overview about how CMC help researchers uh, in the space of AI and ML. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the infrastructure. So at a very high level, our mission is really uh, to uh, help researchers throughout their AI development journey. And we do this uh, in particular in, in these uh, three categories. So build, uh, optimize, and deploy. In terms of building, you take a, a, no, a deep neural network with a data set and uh, you do some uh, training from scratch or you, do, uh, or you use uh, transfer learning by using a pre-trained model to a particular task. And then we offer uh, all these uh, popular uh, machine learning, deep learning frameworks uh, to, that are accelerators, acceler accelerated in FPGAs, GPUs, uh, custom accelerators. And uh, finally, we have a, a quantum computer that people can use. Uh, the ONNX model is, is, the, is the framework we use uh, in order to uh, deploy across multiple, uh, multiple uh, platforms or different platforms. And we have uh, developed uh, many use cases that people can, uh, can start with in, in this space and that, that they are available. In terms of deployment, we have cloud and edge services. And to give more details about what CMC offer, I will go to the, the next slide. So in terms of building, we have an FPGA GPU cluster up and running. And uh, this consists of uh, GP FPGAs, GPUs for training, and uh, some nodes with one FPGA, one GPU to do hardware emulation, FPGA prototyping. 
Uh, upcoming soon is a uh, very high performance uh, AI training inference cluster from Huawei. It's the Atlas 800. And this is uh, delivering uh, this is delivering eight uh, petaflops at uh, floating point uh, 16 and a software stack that allow a lot of uh, users at the same time. We have partnership with DeepLight, which offer an AI driven optimizer and Davis today uh, will be uh, talking about uh, about uh, Neutrino, which which is a, a framework that uh, make a faster, smaller and energy efficient deep neural network from the cloud to the edge. As for deployments, we have uh, different uh, offering, including uh, RISC V uh, processor based uh, board with an embedded FPGA. And this is where you combine uh, RISC V with embedded FPGA to do some hardware offloading. We have also developed with partners uh, in collaborative projects uh, a Balor RISC V uh, processor for AI acceleration. And uh, Mohamed will be talking about this today and uh, a uh, Atlas 200 DK AI development kit, which is a, a, a very nice platform for uh, researchers to explore AI at the edge. Uh, the quantum computer, we have a, a team, uh, a, a, quant a CMC quantum coder team that can help you uh, mapping your uh, your uh, deep neural network uh, training or, or on, uh, on the IBM uh, comp uh, quantum computer. And uh, this is uh, this is part of an ongoing effort, and we'd like to see more projects uh, taking benefits of quantum computing, really to 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 do some breakthrough in uh, in AI. Uh, my last slide, uh, actually, uh, we offer uh, IoT and edge computing devices. This is from uh, uh, we have an IoT mode hardware, so with uh, with the Bluetooth, you can process uh, data coming from a sensor locally and uh, we have uh, sensors that are uh, sensor developments with uh, which are based on chemical sensing and optical sensing as well which really enhance uh, comp uh, ai at the edge uh, by uh, combining uh, data coming from these sensor and processing them locally and you can you can uh, access this infrastructure by simply uh, going to cmc cloud and selecting one of the instances uh, reserve it manage it uh, connect to it and then you have access to uh, all this framework and uh, with jupyter notebook if you want to uh, to run your code from a browser uh, or you can simply use a terminal so this is by simply using uh, Conda Activate, uh, the framework you need, and this is pre-validated. And if you need really to get started with, with this, you can book a demo with us and we can show you all these capabilities. So now back to the uh, workshop agenda, and uh, I will uh, I will uh, ask uh, our first speaker, uh, uh, Derek Wan Wang from Huawei, uh, to share his uh, his desktop and uh, to to present uh, uh, the CAN Unified Heterogeneous Computing Architecture to unleash ultimate hardware computing power. So Derek, I will give you a few seconds to set up your. I will and share my screen. Okay. And, Thanks, Yasin. Uh, so, so Dr. Wang is a senior researcher in Huawei, Canada, working on uh, AI hardware, software, and application developments. And CAN is a computing architecture for neural network uh, invented by Huawei, and it delivers ultimate graph compilation technology and abundant uh, high performance operators to help achieve the maximum computing power of Huawei Ascent AI processor. So this keynote will provide an introduction to this architecture and related AI processor product. Okay, thanks Yasin. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good, uh, thanks Yasin for the introduction. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon. I'm Derek from Huawei Canada. I'm an experienced user of Huawei's uh, Ascend AI platform. And uh, I'm very honored to be here to introduce you the Huawei Ascent CANN, we call it CAN, the Unified Heterogeneous Computing Architecture covering hardware, software co-design and the cloud to edge applications. So AI technology has been widely applied in our daily life in recent days. However, we're still at the entry level of this technique and the human being is still on the way to to the AI era. With the rapid progress in this industry, we are looking forward to further innovations soon. In other words, we are on the verge of an innovation explosion. 
data algorithm and the computing power are the three uh, are the three base elements of the AI technology. At this stage, great changes have undertaken for all these factors. For example, telecommunication industry is coming to 5G era. 5G with ultra high speed and latency free transmission enables much more free data transfer than ever before. Data could travel with speed of 20 gigabits per second and only one millisecond latency, which brings the booming of data. So 5G contributes to the ubiquitous data in our society. Meanwhile, computing has also changed dramatically. In the past, only dedicated devices can be used for computing. Now, intelligent devices have been widely used in industries as well as our daily lives. For example, you could only get one gig top computing power through Pentium 3 processor in 1999. Nowadays, even a smartphone could give 1,000 times more computing power. All these intelligent devices drive pervasive computing. Besides, computing itself has evolved to heterogeneous computing to combat the weakening of Moore's law to deal with the writing of unstruck data. The world is changing fast, and we have seen AI everywhere and will become even more ubiquitous in the coming years. From cloud to edge, from powerful data center to small edge devices, evolution of computing hardware as well as co-design software are demanded to meet such requirements. Today, I will introduce Huawei's Ascend AI processors and the co-designed software computing architecture CAN. So in 2018 Huawei Developer Conference, Huawei released Ascend products. The key feature is full stack, full stack all scenario. So what is full stack all scenario? In the sense of hardware, we have from phone to computing center, all series of products. In the sense of software, we have hardware enablement architecture CAN, Huawei's own framework Manispore, and the application enablement layer, for example, SDK components. One of the key challenges here is to cover such a large range of computation from phone, which requires four to eight tops, camera, which requires eight to 16 tops, to a last 900 cluster, which can provide over 1,000 petaflops. To accommodate such uh, flexibility of computation requirement and the optim optimization for different scenarios is a huge challenge for software designer. That is where CAM plays in. So now let's overview Ascend technical and the product features. Firstly, the DaVinci architecture. The most important feature of it is a cube unit which can do matrix multiplication and the 4096 flow point 16 Mac in one clock cycle. Besides, there are also various computing components, vector and scalar for different computing demands in AI computation. It also has, it also has hierarchical memory architecture, including HBM, various caches and buffer. All these bring challenges for software how to distribute computing load to different components, and for such high computational power, how to feed the data in time and increase its utilization. Another important feature of DaVinci architecture is its scalability. With this unified architecture, we have designed NPUs at different scales from IP of tens of milliwatts to processors of hundreds of watts, covering clouds, edge, and devices. Next, let's look at how the products looks like. In data center, we have inference card and training cards. Their computing power is very high. Besides the absolute computing power, they can also achieve very high performance on real world, uh, real network training or inference. For inference, it is 1.5 time, times faster on average than market and support up to 80 streams of high resolution video analysis on single inference card. For training, it also achieves top performance. Next, let's look at the training cluster. 
1024 training NPUs from the ALAS 900 cluster is the first to reduce training time in ML proof Resma 50 standard benchmark to less than one, one minute. With further improvement on the software architecture CAN, the training time can be further reduced to 28 seconds. The challenge for building such a cluster involves hardware integration, management of cluster nodes, and also maintaining high linearity. Our software architecture CAN has done a great job to explore the heterogeneous computing power and meet these various requirements. Next, let's take a closer look at the components of CAN. As you can see, CAN has many components, but mainly three parts. Firstly, the ACL programming interface. It provides a unified interface for operator development, graph development, graph compilation, and the runtime APIs. Secondly, high performance operator library and the two powerful engines, graph engine for graph optimization and the TensorBoost engine TBE for operator optimi optimization. The third is driver and hardware related. For example, HCCL for collective communication in distributed training and DVPP for media processing acceleration. The goal of CAN is to provide developers efficient development, superior performance, and a full openness. Next, let's look at some details. For efficient development, we support popular frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, ONX, and also Huawei's advanced framework Manusball. With our tools, the GPU training scripts can be easily transferred to Ascend. The various frameworks are supported by Ascend IR, intermediate representation. The computational graph defined from different frameworks are firstly transferred to the IR graph, optimized and passed to the computational entity for execution. The, the Ascend IR 2.0 is coming with more openness for developers. For operator level development, we provide two ways the TBE DSL is using Python language and easy to learn. It implements auto tiling and scheduling, making operator development much easier. The TBE TIC provides instruction level programming and the tuning capability, enabling more flexible computations. To provide a super high performance, firstly, we have high performance operator library the operators are deeply optimized and also flexible for different skill processors. Secondly, the extreme graph optimization. The whole computational graph is compiled and synced to chip for execution, reducing communication between chip and whole CPU. Via graph split and fusion, the number of computation nodes is reduced, thus reducing data transmission. Thirdly, hardware-specific compilation. We have auto-tiling, auto-multi-streaming, SMD, OOE, and data prefetching implemented for a single AI processor to guarantee data throughput and fully utilize the computational power. CAN is also open to developers. Open source, open source model scripts, operator codes, and application demo codes the model zoo provides over 150 pre-trained models for, for model scripts. The internal engines, uh, graph engine and the uh, tensor boost engine are also open. We welcome developers to join our community. Next, uh, let me introduce our community. For developers, Huawei provides a developer kit for quick model development and verification enables AI inference on the edge. That is Huawei Alas 200DK. Based on Alas 200DK, our partners have developed some AI teaching tools based on cars and robots, as well as different AI models. The models can be used, for example, for object detection, classification, and vehicle feature analysis. The DKs are already available in some Canadian universities and will be also available from CMC soon. So now let's see a sample application from uh, Canadian university students. 
And for that, I might need to share my uh, computer's uh, sound. So let me try to share again. Do you want a small animal, but your mom keeps telling you to do your homework? Are you tired of constantly washing your clothes because you can't potty train your hippo? Does your overgrown hamster bark all night and you just don't want to clip its vocal cords? Well, introducing... Many people thought this was a real dog at first, but it's actually just engineered to look identical to one. The eyes of the robot will see you gesture a trick. Think about it in its huge brain, and then the brain will tell the rest of the body what to do. Look at it. It is indistinguishable from a real real pet. The high performance AI device uses three different machine learning models to accurately determine what trick you want the robot to perform. The robot pet loves its owner, so the eyes will follow you as you move around, giving you all its attention. This also ensures that you are in the center of its vision as it captures the perfect photo. Don't want to train your robot? No need! Simply let someone else train it for you, and then politely ask them for the files to add to your own. Watch closely as our robot trainer expertly trains and tells the robot to move around on the table. Now let's listen to a review from a professional. This robot dog is just amazing. It's super clean, and I couldn't even tell it wasn't a dog. I used to lose so much sleep at night because of barking, but this robot can sleep on command. Every pet lover needs one of these. Yeah, thanks. This is a nice work from the students. And uh, besides the DK, we are also providing access to the powerful Alas 800 training servers. So each server has uh, eight ascendant 19 processors and can provide uh, 2.24 uh, petaflops computing power. It'll be available from CMC later this year and training workshops and the technical support will also be provided. Last but not least, we will also provide sessions for Minusball. So Minusball is a Huawei design deep learning framework uh, that best matches the compute power of the Ascend AI processor. So by enabling flexible deployment across device, edge, cloud with industry's best practices, Manusball upgrade the user experience and lower development threshold, bring AI to every home person and organization. So please uh, visit, visit our community website for models, demos, academic uh, videos, and the support and please feel free to contact us for educational or research cooperation and uh, thanks and now uh, my time to invite uh, griffin lacy from nvidia uh, griffin lacy uh, is a senior data scientist uh, for nvidia and his current role is assist customers in designing and deploying their scientific compute infrastructure and prior to nvidia uh, griffin was a deep learning researcher uh, for university of guelph as well at google and in his talk, he will discuss how rapids and open the open source ecosystems are advancing data science. So you have to you, go, you are going to learn how to get started leveraging these open source libraries for faster performance and easier development on GPUs, and see the latest engineering work and new release features, including benchmarks and roadmaps. Griffin, thank you so much, Yasin. and and great job, Derek. That, that was really a uh, nice presentation and uh, I, I trust if, if anyone can't see my screen now you'll let me know and I'll, I'll try to reshare it but um, I, I know a few of you on the call today and, and for the rest my name is Griffin Lacey and I'm a data scientist for NVIDIA in Canada and, and I wanted to take some time today to talk about some really interesting work we've done in the open source community for accelerating machine learning and data analytics on GPUs and, and before I, I get there I wanted to just make a quick reminder that if people are not familiar with the work that NVIDIA has been doing in the last number of years, we, we really are a data center platform. And it, it's not just that we produce GPUs now, um, but we have an entire stack built around accelerated hardware that's enabling you know, all these really interesting business applications at the high end to transparently be accelerated on GPUs. And so there, there's a bunch of interesting things I could talk about 
on the on the hardware side we we just had our gpu technology conference gtc a couple weeks ago and our ceo made some really exciting announcements in regards to to dpus to data processing units and, and also grace our, our cpu that we've announced in our roadmap and but but more i wanted to talk about something that relates to to the software abstraction between the hardware and the in the user applications and and we also made some really interesting announcements about for example q quantum um, for, so for gpu accelerated quantum simulation and so if uh, beyond this presentation today if anyone is interested in, in deep diving on any more of those topics i would just point you at the gtc website where you can um, get a free account and access a huge catalog of, of talks and sessions that were delivered that would uh, drill into more detail than I, I'm able to get into today on, on some of these um, interesting use cases. But I wanted to talk specifically about something called RAPIDS. And so to, to, to give you the high level context, this is going to be a developer toolkit, a, a, a series of open source tools that can be used to accelerate machine learning and, and data analytics on GPU. And so to get there, I think it's important to understand the story as it relates to deep learning, because I think most of you are probably aware today that, that NVIDIA GPUs are very ubiquitous in deep learning. If you go and, and you download TensorFlow or PyTorch, all of the semantics of CUDA and the awareness of how these, these math compilers can compile your, your high level code down to something the GPU can understand and accelerate is very implicit and, and built into the construction of these frameworks from the ground up. And so it, it probably goes without saying that, um, that I, I probably don't need to teach you too much about how to use TensorFlow in, in PyTorch with GPUs. You can just go on the, the main developer documentation um, and they'll tell you all about how to use CUDA and, and, and how to install um, CUDA and CUDA accelerated libraries in your stack so that you can take advantage of those um, acceleration properties. But what I did want to talk about is something that's a little bit less known and, and I think is in many ways even a more powerful idea, which is this work we've been doing to extend this ubiquity of, of GPUs for data science, but extending it into the Pi data community. So to this other class of libraries that are really important for data science, but not necessarily in the context of neural networks. And so at a very high level, this is going to be a, a bunch of libraries that are going to be similar to things like pandas for data frame manipulation or scikit-learn for, for classic machine learning and statistical modeling. And so what, what I have to present today is, is basically these tools that allow you to do something like pandas on GPU or something like scikit-learn on GPU. And so that's what I wanted to dig into more. And so I'm, I'm taking these slides actually from our, our Rapids website. So if you go to rapids.ai and, and click on the documentation tab and go to overview, uh, you'll, you'll be able to see many of these slides that were released as part of our, our 0.19 release, which is our latest minor revision. Um, th there's been a lot of work that's been done in the last couple of years since, since Rapids was first formulated. And uh, you know we've got a huge community of contributors and, and I hope that you know, some of you are able to benefit from this work and, and perhaps contribute back yourself. And, and to motivate the reason for, I think, why Rapids is such a powerful idea, you know, we, we first must address the question of why would you care about GPUs for data science? And, and there's numerous hardware, advantage, uh, hardware advantages here. The obvious one being that there's thousands of cores available to you in something like an NVIDIA DGX A100 system, of which you can see the block diagram on the right you get something like 20 teraflops of, of general purpose compute performance. Uh, but as well, you have up to, for example, 1.5, I think it's about 1.5 or 1.6 terabytes per second of memory bandwidth available to you in, in this type of system, which is an eight-way um, A100 system. Uh, beyond that, you also have these, these really incredible uh, proprietary hardware interconnects called NVLink for, for up to 600 gigabytes per second of bidirectional bandwidth between GPUs. So that means that you can have GPUs talk to each other without having to traverse the PCIe or, or the QPI buses, um, which is typically where you're going to find your bottlenecks as you scale up machine learning workloads. Um, and as well, because we can scale up to, for example, 16 GPUs in a single node, basically you get this really, um, this really useful 
uh, hardware resource where you basically never run out of compute relative to the amount of memory bandwidth. And, and this has some really important properties for, for accelerating machine learning. And so then what is RAPIDS and, and why is it important for GPUs? And so in a nutshell, basically it's end-to-end -end GPU accelerated data science. And so this could mean anything from data prep and ETL, so, so something like CUDIF, uh, which is GPU accelerated pandas. And this has really nice integrations with, with things like Dask and UCX for scaling. Um, as well, RAPIDS defines some analytics and machine learning in, in graph libraries, such as QML, so, so GPU accelerated SK Learn, and it includes things like XGBoost and forest inference and hyperparameter optimization and more. As well, we have things like QGraph, such as, um, or, or a, an API uh, drop-in replacement for NetworkX. And as well, there's a bunch of really interesting visualization things um, for, for things like GPU accelerated cross-filtering or, or PyViz integration. And I won't have time to touch on everything. There's a lot here, and I would encourage anyone who's not already familiar with this to go take a look at our, our documentation and in the GitHub that are associated with each of these projects. Uh, but really, the, the way that I would summarize this today is if you're doing um, data science in, in the PyData domain um, and you're using open source tools, Pandas, SKLR, NetworkX, Matplotlib, um, and, and each of those tools maybe you're using Dask for, for distribution and CPU memory to talk to each other, uh, basically RAPIDS is the, is the way in which we can provide GPU acceleration to each of those components. We can extend that to Dask for, for distributed computation. And then we can use, for example, Apache Arrow as an in-memory GPU data format so that each of these tools can talk to each other um, you know, with, with GPU pointers such that we can keep uh, data in GPU memory and we don't have to pay the expensive cost of, of swapping it to the host between, for example, each step of what would be an end-to-end -end accelerated uh, data science pipeline. So I thought it would be worthwhile to just go a little bit over each of some of the libraries that I think are probably most common and, and most popular. Um, the, the first being QDF, and so this would be, as I mentioned, GPU accelerated data frame manipulation um, in an API that, that um, looks and feels identical to pandas. And so if you're using pandas, this should be completely familiar. This is going to be a Python library for manipulating GPU data frames. Um, and so if you're doing something like pandas.readcsv to read in um, um, tabular data, you can just replace that with QDF read CSV. And then the only difference is that it's going to happen way faster and it's going to read it into a QDF data frame for which you can continue to do manipulations directly as you would do in pandas. Uh, but if, you're, if your data set size is big enough and, and you're doing something that's fundamentally a parallel operation, you're, you're going to see a really big performance benefit. And so this is basically, as, as many of these libraries are, a, a Python interface to a CUDA C++ library. And it's got some really nice interoperability with things like NumPy arrays, pandas data frames, and pi arrow tables, as well as, as JIT compilation of, of UDFs using Numba. And so really, OK, why would somebody care about using this? I mentioned that performance was better, but what do I mean by better? Well, we did some benchmarks, and this is a little bit old because this is QDF uh, 0.13. I mentioned we're on 0.19. Uh, but, but basically, you can tell that for this benchmark example, these, these bars, these vertical bars, represent how many times faster the GPU implementation is versus the CPU. And by GPU, I mean using QDF, and in this case, using a Tesla V100, as it was arranged on an, an NVIDIA DGX1, versus on the CPU side here would be using Pandas, and using a dual socket Intel Xeon. Um, I think these are something like 20 core CPUs. And you can tell, so if you're doing a big merge, for example, on 10 million rows, you get 500 times speed up over the CPU. If you're doing it on 100 million rows, it's closer to 1,000 times speed up. And then similarly, you're getting hundreds of times speed up for, for sorts and group buys. Um, and, and basically, this is you know, true across you know, a wide variety of operations that you would care about in data frame manipulation. And as you can tell by this general trend is, is the more data you throw at it, the, the bigger the speed up you realize it. And so moving into QML, which is another really important library, uh, library to be aware of. This is, as I mentioned, for machine learning, and this would be an API match for what SKLearn does today. 
And this is a growing number of, of algorithms that we support, anything from decision trees to K nearest neighbors and SVMs to um, K means and, and DB scan, um, T SNE, Holt Winters. Um, basically, there's a huge variety of algorithms that we're supporting today and we continue to support in the future. And this is a great place in the presentation as well to mention that if there's something that you're really interested in doing on GPUs that is not currently supported today, I would encourage you to either reach out to me or, or more ideally reach out directly on the GitHubs, maybe um, you know, file an issue on the QML GitHub and say like, I would really like this algorithm implemented. And then we can prioritize our engineering effort to doing things that actually matter to people who are using these tools. And so similar to QDF, why would somebody care about this? Well, it, it's because it's faster and in a very similar experiment to what I just talked about. So comparing a V100 to, to dual socket 20 core CPUs, uh, when you look at algorithms like linear regression, you're getting anywhere from maybe what, 25 to 35 times speed up. Um, and on, on, on 4 million rows, obviously you get the greatest advantage. For things like random forest classifiers, you get as much as 80 million times speed up if, if you're looking at 4 million rows. Um, and, and across the board, basically, even in, in the worst case, you're still getting typically an order of magnitude more speed up on on, QDA, or on QML, sorry, on GPUs versus what's possible with, with scikit-learn on CPUs. Um, and, and so there's many benchmarks I could go through to talk about how, you know, how powerful this idea can be, and, and in some cases getting as many as you know, a thousand times speed up for, for operations that are fundam fundamentally parallel. And, and it's probably worth mentioning that your mileage will vary, but in general, if you're doing something that's algorithmically very parallel and you're using enough data, typically you will see a really big benefit to using GPUs to do that. And lastly, I suppose it, it, it's worth talking about Dask very briefly. And so if anyone has been using Dask today, it's this really powerful parallel computing platform uh, for doing distributed computation. And th there was many choices that we had with within Rapids to, to, to figure out, you know, what distributed uh, frameworks for, for parallelism are we going to support? And really, when it came down to why Dask, one of the most important reasons was that it's very popular. You know, it's, it's the most common parallelism framework in, in the PyData and SciPy communities with, with millions of monthly downloads and, and integrations. And it, it's very interoperable with, um, it, you know, HPC, um, uh, Schedulers like Slurm, PBS, and so on. Um, you have very easy migration because it's built on top of you know, NumPy and Pandas and Scikit-Learn, which, as I mentioned, are the are, are many of the libraries that we we treat as first-class citizens in Rapids. And so it was a very obvious choice for us when we looked at okay, how do we take these these PyData libraries and how do we scale them to you know multiple uh, GPUs and in multiple nodes? And, and, and Dask was was always a very good answer for that. And so the, the general paradigm, I would say, is that for people today who are using those PyData libraries uh, on single CPUs uh, using in-memory data, the, the first step is always to, to scale up and accelerate your work. Obviously, take a look at Rapids. And if you're using NumPy, maybe look at QPy. And for Pandas, look at QDF. And then if you're interested in, in scaling that work out to multiple GPUs or multiple nodes of GPUs, where you would typically do so with, with Dask, so using Dask arrays in place of NumPy arrays and Dask data frames in place of Pandas data frames, you can now use the, the integration of Rapids and Dask combined with OpenUCX to do multi-GPU on a single node or across an entire cluster very transparently. And so all of this work is built with interoperability in mind. And it is meant so that you don't have to leave the context of, of PyData too much if, if you're familiar with with NumPy and Pandas and Scikit-Learn, then you're, you're already on your way to understanding how to use something like Dask for, um, for, for distributed computation. And so that, that's the, the end of the, the technical part of, of my, my presentation. I, I did wanna mention that we have a big community of both contributors and adopters um, in, in, in open source organizations we work with for, for Rapids. And so this is a, an effort obviously much greater than NVIDIA. We are a big contributor, but we also have many contributors um, uh, outside of us that, that make this, this collection of tools really great. And if you're interested in, in, in getting involved, there's many ways to do that. I would encourage you to look at the Slack channel, which is where a lot of the conversation happens and we're active on Stack Overflow and, and Twitter and Google Groups. 
And getting started is, is actually really easy. We have in, installations on, on Docker and Conda. You can deploy in your favorite cloud instance. And, and there's also this really nice uh, Google Colab-like environment on Blazing SQL on app.blazingsql.com where you can go and, and try Rapids on a GPU right now in your browser if you wish to do, do so. And we've got lots of uh, walkthrough videos and blog content. We publish a lot to Medium and, and on our GitHub. Uh, we have many really good example workflows and tutorial notebooks out there. Um, we've got ways to train you formally or informally in, in self-paced or instructor-led sessions. Um, and, and I would encourage anyone who wants to get started to just go and build your own data science workflows and join the community contribution uh, conversations and then contribute back. I think the way that we move this, this work forward is through GitHub issues and through these online conversations. And so that's a great way to, to get involved. And that's all I had. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for having me while well, I sort this out here. Um, it's, we're really excited to, to share today what DeepLight's been working on in the AI software space. So I think the earlier discussions were awesome, by the way. Thank you very Hi. much. So today, as Yassi mentioned, we're going to focus on, it's a software solution for optimizing deep learning models, a black box framework, given that there's really, the intention is to abstract a lot of the manual trial and error that can get involved when you're trying to take a model that's trained well, and then make it infer as efficiently, as quickly, and as, um, you know, on as little power budget as possible, especially when we're talking with the edge. And so today we're going to look at the software framework for how to achieve really two main things. First is better throughput for applications that can be deployed through the, through the cloud. And we're also really excited about the integration with Neutrino, the library in the CMC AI infrastructure. So that way you can train and optimize and then deploy your networks in a really simple, efficient and, and accessible um, uh, hardware solution. So that is one point we'll touch on as well. So achieving better throughput and optimization. And then also compression will be a big topic uh, here. In particular, how do we automate the design of highly compact or highly compressed models, which has been a big trend as we push, you know, deep learning inference and deep learning deployment to really exciting embedded and low power platforms as well. So, you know, quickly to get into things here, really, really straightforward agenda for today for the, for the time we have. Um, as a quick background, uh, as, as um, Yassine mentioned, we're a Montreal-based company. We're about just over 15 people now. We're really excited to be growing. Um, we, we closed a seed round recently, which is super exciting. And we do lots of uh, really cool partnerships in the space from automotive sector. We're working on things like real-time operating systems and some of the self-driving vehicle uh, efforts, but also with the hardware and, of course, in, uh, ecosystem players like CMC to make our software accessible and to really bring optimization as it becomes more of a broadly um, held uh, a challenge or opportunity in industry to really make the op opportunity to optimize neural networks uh, available to everyone from researchers to industry to, to chip developers, et cetera. And as, as this famous slide points out, I'll, I'll, I'll won't get too much into the detail here, but and actually it's out of, out of date given things like with GPT-3 and just the massive, massive parameterization of, of more complex transformer models nowadays. But this has been the general trend. It's been exciting in that we have better performance, but as has been pointed out in a couple of, couple of talks here, we have the opportunity to develop domain specialized hardware. Um, as some in, NVIDIA customers, we have you know the A100s that we referred to earlier in a, in a DGX box. It's, incredibly powerful what you can achieve nowadays from the training side. Um, and at the same time, you know, really the real interesting solution, I think, is where these new hardware opportunities, you know, hard co-design, heterogeneous systems, plus more effort in optimizing and making models more platform aware or hardware aware. That's really what this slide represents in terms of the intersection of the path forward, especially for energy efficient and for cost-effective deployment to, of inference for, for, for deep, deep neural networks in particular. So today we're going to talk about how do we really achieve the kind of this top top level goal of, of, of making models, uh, meaning the content, so the you know the, the, the parameters and you know the number of operations, et cetera, and also you know mapping them somehow intelligently to to the available silicon we have. And more specifically, when we talk about the term optimization, because optimization can be used in a lot of ways, especially when we're talking about about deep learning, we're talking about this level two here. So it might be familiar with terms like pruning or sparsity or distillation, which are becoming in quantization, which are you know, more effective ways to, to reduce the footprint of, of a deep learning model once it's trained. And there's a lot of really interesting training infrastructure that exists, like we were talking about earlier, which allows us to achieve this complexity with our deep learning models. But as we go down the levels here, you know, closer to the target hardware for inference we mean here, so the target inference hardware, there's still a lot of opportunity and frankly, a, a strong necessity to, to make neural networks optimized so that we can fit them on things like this little 
like Cortex like M4 microcontroller, for example. That's something that is really powerful, especially when you consider just the volume of, of these kinds of devices that are all around us and home assistants, smart, smart, smart uh, Bluetooth headphones, et cetera. So that's really the level two and level three type optimization. In particular, through Trino, we're focusing on model optimization. What you can think of it as like some kind of architecture search or design space exploration where we basically give some criteria to the engine about accuracy, about the size of our model, and then ask this engine to take our well-trained model, so our, our, our initial model, pre-trained model, and optimize the architecture to meet the constraints we have. And the reason we want to do this, in particular for Edge, which is one of the trends yesterday you mentioned at the beginning, it's because size is one of the big challenges and the cost here. We talk about the performance bottleneck of power consumption, of latency, and as we want to make, you know, no networks of power, either things like human machine interface or optical inspection or, or perception workloads. We want to make them as seamless, efficient, and especially like as cost effective as possible as we try to pack more intelligence into embedded devices. And also, when we're talking about the cloud, uh, we have different challenges, more throughput related, but on the edge side, it's really size and meeting, meeting these kinds of resource constraints. So that's what we want to focus on. In this case, you know, how do we achieve a good design automation workflow from taking these, these train models that exist that are accurate enough that are, that are good and, and human experts can create really good train models and provide an easy software tool chain to, to do design automation around the neural network architecture with a, a low code, as was mentioned earlier, black box engine. And that's really what Neutrino essentially is. This is, this is a software product we've released about over a year ago now. I have some, some commercial users and community users in, in the ecosystem. And it is available on, on, on CMC AI cluster as well, um, basically using the compute infrastructure to power this optimization, which is really exciting and simplifies the process a lot. We talk about you know, kind of, kind of the, the, the um, instrumentation required. But this is what we're going to focus on with Neutrino is taking these large accurate pre-trained models, receive some constraints that the user defines, which I think is really interesting here. This isn't kind of, again, just another extension of a trial and error process. It's really about taking these hard criteria around accuracy or pressure level, uh, even the time of optimization can be considered a criteria here. And, and then again, automating the process of getting a neural network model that meets these constraints. And the way we do this at a high level, so um, this, we'll get into some actual code example in a second, but the way you can conceptually think of this is you have your trained models. This is like a, like a resonant model on the image that subset, for example. I mentioned earlier, there's two different methods here. One's called latency mode. This is more about achieving faster throughput on things like GPUs or, or high-end CPUs, for example. But compression mode is about that size bottleneck we were talking about earlier. And so Neutrino offers this nice compression mode along with some other functions like um, mode essentially means how, how long you want to take the optimization process to take. The longer it takes, the better result you get, for example, like using deep search. And then precision is another function we've been working a lot on. We'll talk about in a little bit about how you can further optimize your models using some kind of low precision quantization as well, which works nicely with the architecture optimization. So in the earlier slide, more like that level three, low level optimization that we can achieve prior to the target hardware. And at the other end comes this optimized model, which we'll see in a second, that's you know, going to meet these constraints you define. And that's really the, the bread and butter of Neutrino. Give a model, define your criteria, and then out comes a, another optimized, an optimized model you can then deploy. So walking through a real example here, you know, when we talk about black box, really it's because you have one function call you can make. And that function is to optimize the model. But what you have uh, available to you as well are a lot of controls and different settings you can use to tweak your optimization in a way that's specialized towards the constraints you have. And so the software that's available for free on, on GitHub as a community version is PyTorch. Uh, our production version is also PyTorch. We have a beta version working on, on TensorFlow version 1.x uh, models, but uh, not in production yet. But you know, the PyTorch code is available and ready to go. Um, and as you can see here, you know, it's pretty simple. In this you know, sample case, we're going to use like a data set like CFARM 100. We have you know, one PyTorch worker in this example. You can use multi-GPU, which is exciting. It can really speed up the optimization process. So we have a backend that works for classification models and soon like detection, segmentation, really any type of CNN model or MLP model uh, can be, can be um, you know, through distributed optimization, multiple machines or multiple, multi GP within different machines. Um, so that's exciting. You have your model here, of course, your acceptable accuracy criteria, which is expressed by Delta. Deep search was that function mentioned earlier about how, how long you want the optimization to take. Then you also define your batch size, basically press run. There's a couple of things I'll mention here. In this case, we're using our, our deep light model zoo. So we also offer on our GitHub and in our production version, a pretty extensive model zoo of pre-trained models. Um, 
which helps speed up experimentation. We also offer some profiling. So this is an older version of the interface, but the profile is a really nice, neat, neat way to get some metrics from your model, which you can then return into the optimization loop or another criteria as well. So you can use it as a reporting mechanism or as like kind of an input signal. Um, and you can also compare models nicely with the profiler code that works. It's open source now in, in both TensorFlow and PyTorch frameworks. Um, and as you can see here, so the model is this accurate. Uh, this is the size in, in full precision. You know, count the MAC operations, number of parameters, memory footprint, which is calculated using weights and activations, batch size of one, and then execution time. So some of the metrics can be a little more hardware specific, but some of them are just really just about the model, which you see here. And then as it analyzes the design space and kind of fast forwarding through a couple of things here, although I will point out, it does estimate for you the length of optimization. So on a single GPU here, like a Titan XP or maybe Titan VGPU, uh, two and a half hours, which is not, not too shabby. And as you see here, though the job completed in two and a half hours is expected, it gives you, this is an older version, it gives you an Onyx model. We now also return a PyTorch JIT or, or a PyTorch object uh, as an output here so you can get these different options. But in a nutshell, what's, what's happened in these two and a half hours in, in this engine is basically defining a 1% accuracy drop, which was met. It went from you know, basically a point, almost just over half a percent drop in accuracy, which is acceptable here. Compression was reduced you know, from 76 megabytes to 2.7. That's in full precision. So you could quantize that model further and get additional compression. Mac was reduced by about 5x five, five here. And memory footprint was also nicely reduced. Execution time we see is not so greatly improved here. And that's because in compression mode, you know, this is while well, this model is being profiled on a GPU, we really want to focus on the size reduction for those edge devices. In latency mode, the kind of opposite is true. So if you were to enable the other mode I mentioned, then you see maybe more of a, a increase in speed up, but the compression be more modest. And that's the intuition behind these two modes, depending on if you're inferencing in a, like a high throughput scenario on, on a GPU or cloud, or if you really need to compress your model to fit it onto like an edge device. So just want to be respectful of time here. So I'll skip through, happy to, to make this available too, so you can go through the slides later. Um, and some of the stuff is, on, is public as well, but one quick idea on how we achieve this compression to give more detail, you can see this from some of the optimized architectures if you, if you use visualize it like Netron or something, but basically you can approximate these big, large, large convolution layers with a series of thinner and deeper models. So that's why execution time in this compression strategy is not as affected, but you get a massive reduction in size is because you can approximate these big layers with, with thinner layers that have much less parameters and, and thus afford a nice, nice compression. This is not the only, only uh, trick I would say, but it's, it's one that we found quite effective that on a shares that can achieve nice, nice compression with. It's actually in one of our uh, papers we published recently. And to give a little more detail on some of the, you know, by no means exhaustive lists, but you know, a few sample models that are networks that are well known, you know, while controlling accuracy within certain thresholds, in full precision, this is the kind of compression we can expect. And again, you know, quantization would, would just further improve these results, which is, which is a nice thing to have at your disposal. A couple of real world examples. We did this with a RISC-V CPU. So there'll be a really exciting talk actually, just actually after this one about some RISC-V work. Uh, we were big fans of it in the space at Deep Light. Um, we worked with a, a Taiwanese uh, provider called Andy's Tech um, around kind of, instead of using basic motion detection or which is very expensive from the cloud perspective is, you know, keyword spotting if you're streaming audio, the idea was to use a low power MCU connected camera to basically wake up when a person enters the frame. And we were able to compress this model to a form factor that was even smaller than things like TensorFlow Lite Micro, which afforded us to put it on a very small low power, this five CPU with a DSP, uh, sorry, vector extensions. Um, which is really a, a really cool solution for these kind of low power workloads. Another example, um, object detection for traffic sign we did with a Montreal based company called eSmart where we were fitting, you know, these kinds of workloads to like a, a low power Texas instrument CPU uh, for more kind of complicated things like multi-class object detection. So that's exciting when you can compress models like YOLO V3, which are typically, you know, hundreds of megabytes and get them to fit onto some of these hardware with very limited memory, um, super exciting. And I'll, I'll kind of wrap up here with a couple of, of observations and, and then leave some time for questions. But one of the things we've noticed, which is quite interesting and extends to you know, even the bigger class of models, but this is you know, kind of a, a well-known set here, is instead of trying to, to go to very compact models from the get-go, like Moment V2, SSD Lite, or ShuffleNet, for example, et cetera, depending on the use case, it actually can be a better practice sometimes to train a large over-parameterized model to really achieve the highest baseline, highest training performance you can possible, and then hand off to the second compression stage or optimization stage for inference, which actually affords you, in a lot of cases, even higher accuracy 
and smaller size than if you tried to achieve by taking one of these compact models. So that's not to say you can't take one of these shuffle nets or moment models and then optimize them further. We certainly do that quite a bit with our customers. And that's also successful to, to squeeze out more performance. But one of the things we've seen work very well to get a better trade-off in accuracy and size is to train large and then compress. And it makes sense. And in some cases, you can actually regularize your models really nicely where we get, even on a compressed model, you get better performance on unseen data, which for some applications like automotive, uh, the industry is really excited about. So we want to share that. Last thing here, I did mention we talk about low precision. This is a preliminary set of experiments, but we wanted to test, you know, even with extreme compression, can you still quantize models to, to very extreme low precisions? And the answer is yes. And that's really exciting. Um, we have a product coming out later this year called DLRT, Deep Light Runtime for CPUs for inference that takes advantage of this with a new custom inference engine. Um, so, you know, really excited to share that at Complement Neutrino, which is already available from the, on the CMC infrastructure as well. Um, so that's another potential software coming out I wanted to talk about. And just lastly, we do have, as I mentioned, um, an open source, uh, both profiler and model zoo available. If you go to our GitHub, the link is just on the next slide and the neutrino compression engine, which you walked through today, which provides that kind of black box model optimization is available. We'd love to get your feedback. It's really easy to, to get access. You just need to follow steps on GitHub. And with that, um, again, so you know, Yassin CMC, thanks so much for having us present. We're always, always happy um, to be part of CMC events. And thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you very much, Davis. Uh, and now before the break, uh, we are going to have uh, our last presentation before the break. And I will uh, call Mohamed Hussein to share his desktop. And uh, in the meantime, I will present him. So uh, Mohamed is a PhD candidate and researcher at Ecole Polytechnique of Montreal. And I had the pleasure to work with Mohamed on a collaborative project uh, where he developed a barrel risk five processor for AI acceleration. So this is a risk five processor designed to control an array of hardware accelerators for a deep learning, deep uh, neural network models called matrix vector product unit or MVUs. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Yassine, for uh, the introduction. My name is uh, Mohamed Hussein Eskayemad. And today I want to talk about Barveen, which is a battery five neural network accelerator. So in today's talk, I'm going to talk about our uh, motivation for designing Barveen, and we'll go over the uh, the architecture and overview of Barveen. We show some uh, use case uh, that we use to uh, we use Barveen to do matrix multiplication, and we'll show you how you want you can run neural networks on Barveen. Okay, so uh, this project was definitely a group project. It was, uh, although I'm presenting, but it was initiated by Sean Wagner and Alexa back in 2018. Then it was picked up by Polytechnique Montreal uh, group in uh, 2019, and it was led by Yvonne Savary and Jean-Pierre David and me. And uh, Yassine, oops, Yassine is helping us uh, to uh, deploy it on FPGA and uh, CMC servers. So uh, let's talk about the motivation for designing Barveen. Uh, I don't know why it's moving. Okay. So as you know, machine learning models require a lot of computation power. And uh, as an example, uh, uh, you can, uh, you, uh, as an example, like a ResNet 50 with ImageNet uh, data set, it requires around uh, four gigaflops of uh, computation. So there are a couple of methods to reduce this computation. Uh, two of which are called uh, quantization and uh, pruning. Uh, in quantization, the uh, idea is to use lower precision parameters, and uh, that will help you with uh, lower power consumption and lower memory footprint, and that would lead to uh, faster computation. And the, in pruning, the idea is to remove unnecessary parameters from the model, and that helps with uh, memory footprint. And in today's talk, and this project was mainly behind uh, using uh, quantization methods. So, uh, quantization uh, is a hot topic uh, nowadays, uh, just in iClear and AAAI. So, in uh, 2021, uh, iClear 2021 and AAAI 2021, there were more than 25 papers uh, published just on quantization. And as you already know, most of the AI frameworks uh, such as PyTorch and TensorFlow already support the uh, quantization. Uh, the uh, idea, 
Okay, so uh, this figure shows you a typical, uh, like although we have many quantization methods uh, proposed each year, but the main idea behind, uh, you know, uh, quantization is uh, what you can see in this figure. This picture is uh, 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 showing you low precision computation in LSQ that was presented last year in 2020. And the main idea here is to quantize the model uh, to lower bit precision and have a matrix, uh, for, for example, an accelerator, in this case, a matrix multiplier that operates in low precision. And after the results uh, are done in low precision, then we will use a multiplier or a scaling factor to rescale back the values to a floating point. If you review the research projects, you will see that most of the quantization methods require uh, sub eight bit. Uh, sub 8 bit uh, precision uh, however there are no uh, commercially available cpu or gpu that uh, supports uh, these uh, you know sub 8 bit precision and our main uh, idea for designing and motivation for designing barring was to uh, you know add uh, this uh, support in a real hardware so for researchers can you know uh, see uh, the uh, the um, uh, they can see that they actually can run low precision on the real hardware. And we provide that in Barvin on matrix vector granularity from uh, one bit to 16 bit precision. So what is Barvin? Barvin is a battery risk five neural network accelerator. Uh, and we allow, and uh, that uh, we allow a matrix vector product uh, uh, with arbitrary precision. It's a design for FPGA implementation. And uh, in Barvin, we have, uh, we allow uh, one bit to 16 bit uh, uh, data types. So as we talked about, it's a, uh, we have a barrel core as a controller. It is attached to a vector matrix vector unit array. And this has been implemented on an FPGA board. Uh, we support uh, uh, in, a, in a future, we're gonna support uh, adding a host uh, to this design, but that still is in a work in, in progress. So the main part of the uh, um, our uh, project is two uh, uh, two IPs. One of them is a matrix vector unit, which is in base configuration. It can do a matrix product between a weight matrix of sixty four by sixty four on one bit precision, and with a vector input vector of sixty four elements on two bit uh, precision. And at this base configuration, we will give uh, 8.2 teramac uh, uh, peak throughput. And the other part is our barrel controller. It's a RISC-V barrel processor that is compatible with uh, RV32i spec. It's a five-stage pipeline processor and has eight hardware threads. Uh, it allows you to run uh, uh, you know, um, all uh, you can compile your code with the uh, GNU toolchain since it's uh, compatible with RV32i and uh, it currently runs at uh, 250 megahertz. So, the way that we connect uh, the MVU to uh, P2, uh, uh, the RISC V controller, is through uh, RISC V CSRs, uh, control status registers. And these CSRs are uh, like RISC-V based CSRs are software controllable. And we allow, uh, we allow uh, the user to control a different part of the MVU through, this, uh, through these CSRs. So let me show you that by uh, showing you a, a use case. And in this use case, we are doing a matrix multiply between a weight matrix of 128 by 128 with an input vector of eight by 128. And we want to do uh, uh, a product with a, a weight input and output precision of two bits. So the first part of the code is just setting up the uh, precisions for all the variables. The next part is we will set uh, the uh, input, output, and weight addresses. The next part is to, uh, since we, we allow different uh, memory access patterns, uh, we're setting the uh, the associated CSRs, and finally we can kickstart the uh, the, pro the uh, job. And uh, these CSRs, as you can see, they're in assembly, but uh, you can write uh, you know uh, inline assembly in C to uh, to do that. However, we also uh, we already provide some 
uh, you know, op not optimized, but some uh, basic operations in assembly so you can use them in your, uh, in your C code. So although running a matrix multiply is cool, but uh, in running neural network is much more than that. Uh, the idea here is to have a PyTorch model and actually run it in, uh, in bar mean. So to allow that, we uh, added a code generator from uh, machine learning right. model down to uh, hex code. And right now, our code generator supports uh, Onyx models. However, you need to do. Uh, sorry. So, however, uh, currently we only support, uh, as I said, uh, Onyx model. But to do training and uh, pruning, we need to do it before uh, doing uh, running it through the code generator. And uh, the code generator that we provide is a Python library that you can use in any uh, Python script. Now, let me show you a demo of how you can use that. So as you can see here, we, we are using an uh, ResNet 18 model with a two bit precision for activation, two bit for weights and two bits for output with input shape of 32 by 32 and uh, three. This is for C400 uh, uh, model. And when you run that, the first thing is a table that will give you all the MVU configurations that you need to program uh, uh, for, the, for the job. And uh, you can use them as is, or you can, uh, we have a code generator that also generates uh, from a template file uh, job uh, that, that supports a job configuration, uh, such as this table. Once you get your uh, MVU configuration, then uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, code generator will generate uh, the memory uh, for, uh, for weights and uh, other configurations. Since our memory is in a special format, uh, we need to do it prior to running the code on, on Barbie. And this is already supported in our uh, code generator. So last, uh, lastly, the Barbie is already uh, on GitHub and uh, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, we have a lot of uh, documentation. Uh, uh, I don't know if do you see my uh, GitHub page right now. Uh, I assume that's yes, but uh, here we have uh, our uh, GitHub project, and you can just uh, clone the project, and there are uh, more than thirty pages of documentation uh, in our GitHub. Finally, uh, I want to I want to thank uh, the open source uh, community for hardware projects. Uh, especially Fusat for allowing us to use their package manager and uh, build us abstraction tools. Uh, open hardware and pulp, uh, we used uh, some of their IPs and got ideas how to uh, you know, use it for, uh, for uh, in Barveen. And the wave drum for a tool that allows you to draw awesome timing diagram and uh, register file to, uh, diagrams. And uh, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, CMC, IBM, Enzerich, uh, Mila, and FRQNT. And I think uh, me or Yasin, we can tell you uh, what would be uh, a, a delivery from CNC that uh, allows you to use Barvi in your project. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed, uh, for a good presentation. Uh, just a reminder that uh, Mohammed is really focusing on hardware innovation. Uh, it's really uh, squeezing the performance out of each transistor. And he's doing that by uh, providing this uh, open source so people can play with different configuration and maybe uh, target different application. CMC will uh, deliver a uh, stable version of what Mohammed uh, is uh, working on. And there will be a variety of version of it. So there will be uh, emulation and also FPGA prototyping. And this will be uh, posted on uh, CMC see GitHub, uh, GitHub for the next uh, couple of weeks. So, all right, so welcome back everyone. Uh, we are going to resume the session and uh, I will call uh, Professor George Shaker to share his desktop. So Professor Shaker is in uh, at the Department of Mechanical and Mechatronic Engineering, as well as the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Waterloo. 
He is currently leading project related to the application of wireless sensor systems for healthcare automotive and unmanned aerial vehicles. In his talk, Professor Shaker will present uh, an overview of advanced sensing functionalities using low-cost radar combined with uh, AI, with a demonstration of some applications in remote healthcare monitoring and discussion in the design process testing procedure and implementation challenges. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Yassine, for the invite to speak here today. So, um, as Yassine mentioned, I'm going to be speaking about some of the low-cost radars that we have been using and uh, augmenting them with artificial intelligence for some advanced sensing. Um, the, this is a bit of an overview to what we have been doing at the lab. My lab is the Wireless Sensors and Devices Lab, and we do lots uh, of applications, and they are all centered about applied electromagnetics. Uh, so lots on power transfer, uh, lots on sensing, lots on actuation, lots on data transfer. And we have been working a lot with industry. Those are some of the industry sponsors that uh, have sponsored our research over the last few years. Uh, some of the key features we have um, in the facility is the fact that we have access to uh, a full uh, research apartment, fully equipped with uh, beds, uh, um, dining area, kitchenette area, uh, exactly like what older adults use in retirement homes and nursing homes. So we can run lots of tests in these apartments. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, basically, I was told I'm the only faculty member who owns a truck and trailer across Canada <laughs> for, for research purposes. We have a couple of bays for testing of autonomous vehicles. And we also have access to the Center of Intelligent Antenna and Radio Systems where we can put in a full vehicle, for example, and run a full set of tests in terms of uh, wireless testing. Um, some of the stuff that I'm, I'm going to speak about today are, are uh, have been seen in the news. Um, uh, some of you are, are familiar with uh, uh, the Google or North's uh, AR uh, VR kit, so we've worked closely with them on that. We have also had access to the Soli Alpha, few years in development, um, early in the development, maybe from 2015 or so, that became finally part of the Pixel 4 phones. Uh, we've been featured on CNN and, and, and I've been invited to speak at the US Congress related to some of the recent changes because of uh, the work that has been going uh, related to sensing automotives. Um, so let's let's pick a, a case and then from that case I'm gonna I'm gonna I use that design case to cover other other ideas or other research uh, concepts that we've been looking into. So, one of the example problems within the automotive domain is trying to figure out if a driver is distracted and also trying to figure out um, how many passengers there are in a vehicle. The reason is, of course, for total purposes, but also for airbag deployment. Another big need is to understand if a child or a pet are being left behind. And of course, somehow being able to do some gesture sensing uh, for infotainment system control. So, um, if you look at this particular problem, uh, particularly on the sensing side of, of the occupancy, uh, you can think of mechanical sensors. They can detect weight, force, acceleration, or pressure, um, but they fail to distinguish between different humans and objects, so, um, which is a big deal. Um, so they are really prone to force alarms. You can look at thermal cameras or, or camera vision in general, but these have issues with field of view blockage because of the seats and because where you put the sensors. And also they're very sensitive to, especially the cameras to illumination levels. And they have that embedded fear about privacy issues uh, using cameras in general. Um, we have been looking into the use of radars instead of, of using these other tech. And, and the idea for you who don't know about radars, the, the radar system is, is a bit simple in the sense that you generate the waveform. That waveform is transmitted, hits an object, returns back, and then you're doing some radar processing to be able to uh, figure out the range where this object is and also figure out the uh, speed this object is moving at. Uh, most of us are familiar with these uh, and, um, uh, and roads in general because they usually end up in us being ticketed, but uh, uh, the same principles apply to other applications uh, like what we're discussing here. Um, you can send different waveforms. They could be pulsed, they could be continuous wave, frequency modulated waves. So there are many ways we can do it. But at the end of the day, we care much about the range resolution, how much 
can resolve, can be resolved with using a particular radar, which is also function of the bandwidth used by that radar. The velocity resolution, um, which can be achieved, which is function of the frequency and the angle resolution, which is function of the angle, uh, the number of receivers uh, used by the radar. Of course, the radars promise privacy because they inherently detect the speed and the, 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 where the objects are, they are low power and also low cost comparative to the camera systems and they work nicely in, in night uh, vision scenarios. So let's take a seven seater, for example. And, and one of the questions would be, where do we place the radar and, and which radar to use in order to be able to count how many passengers there are in, in this particular vehicle and figure out if a child is being left behind. I'll, I'll pick up on, on one, one use case here, one, one simple radar, which has three transmitters for receivers. So one thing, of course, to think about is this simple PCB can be mounted in different ways inside a vehicle. And, and just for simplicity, let's think of this mount. You put this PCB in this mount and you can rotate it anywhere inside the vehicle. Uh, the question is, is this front end good enough or not? And you can think of this compared to cameras about uh, looking into the field of view. So you can have cameras with wider lens, narrower lens. This is exactly what's happening here. And you can see from full wave simulations of the full interior of the vehicle, how certain uh, configuration of the antennas will give you uh, uh, nearly similar field of view across all seats or very different ones. So you can see that the power is very different across the seats, which may not be desirable because then certain areas will be more, more or less like blind spots to the, to the uh, radar camera system we're using, if you want to think about it this way. Um, the, because we can, if we have a good field of view, if we can monitor the, across the, the, the whole platform or the whole vehicle, interior and because radars can penetrate through the seats because if you if you look at these seats most of the seats are yes they are metallic but they have lots of of basically holes within them and radars can easily penetrate these ones so it could be in front of the front seats but they can see all the way to the back now the the interesting thing doing this is through simple radars um, signal processing we can see an empty vehicle nicely and we can see uh, a vehicle with let's say a baby inside and, and one advantage doing it this way is you can think about this vehicle, which has lots of clutter, shovels, keyboards, everything. If you put the camera system, most likely they cannot see for, through this. And if you think about the back of this seat and if there is a baby underneath the seat, by the way, this is a doll that we use that has a mechanical motor inside. So the motor moves mimicking breathing rate. So we could extract breathing, breathing um, uh, uh, waveforms this way. Um, so if you think about uh, this particular use case, a camera can no, no way see across this behind this uh, row, for example. But the radar actually can. It can penetrate these materials as long as they are not purely metallic and go all the way through. And it, the radar can detect the very, very micro vibrations coming in from the chest of, of this doll, which will indicate that there is, there is actually uh, a living being left behind the vehicle. One of the issues that the radar cannot do though at this point is figuring out if this is actually uh, a child or, or an adult. Uh, because if you want to sound an alarm, if, if a parent leaves uh, a kid or a child uh, behind, you don't want to sound the alarm if, if a person decides to sleep in the back seat and they are adult, they just they don't want to, to, to uh, exit the vehicle, they just want to sleep for a while, right? So this system is going to detect the breathing rate, but it cannot tell if this is a child or an adult. And that's where we started thinking, okay, uh, we, have to, we have to do maybe something a bit different there. And, and looking at um, the other idea on, on the counting as well, so how many passengers there are in this particular scenario, and again, using the same, the same camera radar system and, and using standards uh, of the shelf uh, algorithms available now, uh, signal processing algorithms for radars, you can see that the, these ones are getting confused counting the people. Uh, sometimes they are thinking there are two passengers, three passengers, four passengers, and sometimes five, although we can clearly see there are five. And the issue is related to the angle resolution of the radar. Basically, the, the radar can't resolve um, uh, accurately uh, the, the last three passengers there. So they are sometimes thinking they're one big passenger, sometimes two, sometimes three. Uh, one way to solve this, of course, is to go and basically, instead of using this particular chip with the three transmitters for receiver, you do a cascading of those. That will give you 12 transmitters and, and um, so basically you're, you're adding one, two, three, four. So four chips, yeah, you multiply by the three transmitters and then you have 16 receivers, but then all of a sudden you uh, can have uh, a very, very large number of channels to have a very, very good resolution there. But the problem doing that is you nearly quadruple, if not even more, 
the price of the system. So that makes the system very expensive and, and that will make it a bit not desirable to use eventually. Um, so the trick we've, we've looked into is, okay, so what if instead of, of using a very advanced radar board that's very expensive, using a simple one, low cost one, in the, in the, we're talking about a few dollars here, and, and basically doing the range Doppler and the angle of arrival on, on these data, which is radar signal processing, but then adding a layer of machine learning. And, and lots of our work has been trying to figure out what suitable machine learning can we use and what type of effort is needed uh, so that we can, we can achieve basically a, a decent end result for, for what we've been trying to do. So let's, let's pick on the case where we've been trying to count the people inside the car, for example. Um, in this case, we needed a huge campaign to train the system what's an empty car versus what's an occupied car. And if you think about it, we have uh, focusing only on five seats. Sometimes we have this seat occupied, one of the back seats occupied, and then all these combinations, right? So five occupied or not, you can think about 32 combinations in there. Um, so we decided one way of doing it, of course, we had the student volunteers involved in this study, but we also did build a few, uh, a number of dolls and equip these dolls with um, motors inside them so that we can mimic the breathing rate uh, motion. And we, we ran a huge campaign, basically uh, putting these dolls in different seats. Some of you may recognize these from the Ugly Dolls movie, but basically we had a huge set of these ones uh, along with the, with the uh, actual uh, uh, human beings involved in the study. And, and we ran the study to look into, uh, with again, with different scenarios, including uh, uh, lots of clutter to see if we can have a meaningful set of data to train the machine learning and see if we can extract something useful out of it. Um, so this is a bit of a summary of what we have done in terms of the results using RF and SVM and KNN. And you can see that we can, these cases basically like a, a case 0, 0, 0, 0 is where there's nobody in the vehicle. And you can see that, yeah, we can detect if the vehicle is empty very nicely. And this, this data can be always used for intrusion detection, for counting, uh, many, many applications within the vehicle. And the platform cost itself is, is really, really uh, very low cost. When it gets to the more advanced features where basically counting, that's where, yeah, things are a bit more complex in there because, uh, and, and the accuracy degrades a bit, but still in most of the cases, um, we are, we're in the high nineties and, and the multi-class classification. The, the same idea can be applied to distracted driving. And, and basically, again, if you move the system from the back of the vehicle and put it on the front of the vehicle to monitor the driver, we, we, we can do an extra step there. And instead of just detecting the a simple breathing motion of, of the driver, which can try to do some type of, of imaging. And you can see, for example, if the driver is breathing, this is a type of very low um, resolution image if you want to think about it this way. So it's, it's conserving privacy, but in the same time, we can create out of this, what we call a point cloud. And that point cloud is what we feed into the machine learning algorithm to see if we can train it to recognize if the person is looking forward or sideways, for example. And, and this is a sample of some of the point clouds that we have generated with a study like this. So for example, the operator is looking forward, looking sideways, um, um, uh, looking, uh, behind, looking at the cell phone, for example. And, and you can see that the, many of these point clouds are, are good enough that when you feed them to the machine learning uh, platform, this should be able to identify quickly the status of, of the driver. Now, the idea is actually extendable to other applications. So for example, this is one case where we, we paired the, the sensing that we had with a, so this is actually our radar platform and the radar platform is connected to the infotainment system in the car. And this is one of the students driving a Cadillac. And then basically we, we activated the phone call uh, using this simple gesture. So again, the recognizing the gesture in the environment by different users, uh, of course, different users will have different ways of doing the gesture slightly. So training across multiple users, testing across the others, lots of activities we have done in this area. And, and we have seen that, yeah, we can actually with a couple of dollar chipsets plus, plus a simple uh, classifier, we can do some interesting applications in this domain. Um, and the same principles we have been doing and, and these problems that I described, we have applied to other applications. So uh, to vital signs, gate and activity recognition, identification and security applications, um, non-invasive glucose sensing, um, uh, lots about the home entertainment systems, AR, VR control. We have done lots in the area of tangible interaction and, and also in, in the areas of UV and drone, whether using them for mapping, real mapping or using or basically mimicking the same approaches, but for sensing or detection of these uh, uh, systems. 
So I'll give you a couple of examples on the vital signs and gait activity and, and then maybe open it for a bit of questions here. Um, so in the vital signs, exactly what we have done with the dolls, but expanded it a bit. And we have done it where we could look into, for example, on older adults and, and instead of asking them to wear all these wires, which is actually standard in, in lots of the tests nowadays for sleep clinics, for example, we can use our radar system mounted to a ceiling, no wires, nothing involved. And here's some of the data that we generated in breathing on heart rate and, and very similar um, to, to what could be extracted by some of the gold standards. Now, when you think about sleeping, typically people tend to um, like their, their partners and there were two persons. So can we use this system to monitor two people? And can we take it away from the deterministic, more deterministic breathing rates and heart rate to adding more uh, machine learning value there where we can actually extract not only the breathing rate and heart rate, but also the position of sleeping, for example, right? And which is very valuable in bed sore detection or monitoring or, or on a warning system. And, and, and this is one of the, the cases we had where we had two of the students and we asked them to sleep in different positions. Uh, we had the radar into the ceiling and we actually could monitor their breathing rate, heart rate, and we could monitor their, their sleeping position. So they're sideways back. Uh, we, and all of this is, is a hybrid between the, the, the machine learning side and, and the radar side. Um, of course, multiple people monitoring at home is, is very important nowadays and especially with COVID and such. So. Um, being able not only to monitor the vitals, but the activity levels is very important. So again, the same system with, with some machine learning involved in there, we could do walking analysis. Uh, we can detect if the person is sitting idle, um, if, if they have been in home or exited the home, uh, if they have been in the bathroom or not, uh, how many hours they slept. So we can create this type of very important data. Which is, which is important to relate to the medical professionals. The, most of the work we have done, we have been focusing on, on relaying the data to the clouds because that's that's simpler uh, approach at least to this point, but uh, we're seeing more and more interest in, in trying to do this on the edge. And, and you can imagine when it comes to privacy and, and only sending the crucial alerts, for example, on the edge would be a very valuable approach for sure. And, and one of the big areas we've been looking into is how to share the data if we're doing it all in the edge what type of data we can share among the edge units for example so that we can uh, share whatever is being learned on the fly and build better or optimize uh, learning approaches going forward this way um, so uh, this this concludes the set of the slides i have i want to acknowledge all the team members i've had they are they're all amazing students that helped uh, foster this work very much and i'm open for any questions thank you our next speaker professor paul chow so please and share your uh, desktop, uh, Professor yeah. uh, Shaker. And uh, Paul is a professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, he was uh, a major contributor to the early risk uh, processor technology developed at Stanford University that helped uh, spawn the rapid rise of computing performance in the past 30 years. His research focuses on reconfigurable computing with emphasis on programming models, middleware to support programming and portability and scaling to large scale distributed FPGA developments. And uh, the presentation today is focusing on AI, on a heterogeneous platform for large scale machine learning. It's called Algene, pronounced it like the C, and it's an open framework to build and deploy machine learning algorithms on a heterogeneous cluster of devices, mainly comprised by CPUs and FPGA. Okay, thanks, Yassine. And I just quick check to make sure everybody is seeing the proper uh, display. I've got multiple monitors, so I'm never sure what other people are seeing. That looked good. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, okay, thanks very much, Yasin, and thanks everybody for uh, coming to the workshop. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a, a project I presented this last year at the same workshop at a time when we thought we were done, but a year later, now we think we're done. And so I'm going to talk a bit more about it and about some of the things uh, that we've been doing. So let's just get started. I think the, with this audience, I'll probably need to not need to do too much here. Of course, machine learning is the big topic of the day in terms of what we're doing and in terms of the computing uh, community. 
and it's of course being used in many places and in fact we've today seen a, a number of talks of uh, different ways that people are using machine learning so one of the things about uh, machine learning is you know talking about performance and energy and looking at different ways to uh, you know improve those metrics and heterogeneity is definitely something that people are, are working towards. So uh, also we can see that um, you know, it's machine learning is deployed at many different scales on many different uh, devices. Our work has been more generally focused on the, the data center scale systems or at least systems where we might have multiple devices coordinating to implement uh, uh, some kind of algorithm. So the way we think about machine learning is that there's a, a design space um, and people work at very various different levels of this design space. Um, so we work on different types of devices, we work on different ways to uh, deploy the devices and how to connect them. Um, people are working on uh, different constraints, power, latency, throughput. And of course, people are working on different algorithms. So what that means is that um, there's a very, very large uh, design space that we have to uh, uh, worry about. And so, um, what we want to be able to do is to have a way to explore this design space uh, and allow um, people who have expertise in the various different levels to uh, play with this design space, but yet still have a fully kind of uh, functioning uh, system so that they can try out things and see if the entire thing is built. So if I want to play with algorithms, for example, on FPGAs, I don't want to uh, have to figure out how to make all the FPGA parts of this system work. I'd like to just uh, work on the algorithms and then somehow magically have those algorithms run on FPGAs. And, and we'll see how we can do that. Sorry. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, we'll talk a little bit about machine learning uh, frameworks and how they fit in um, a layer or an abs various abstraction layers that we think about. Then we'll talk about uh, what a GN is, which is a uh, a, a marriage of two open source uh, platforms. Um, and then we'll look at how we use a GN to kind of explore the design space, which is again, really what we're trying to enable here, which is to build a platform that allows people to work in uh, at different levels of this design space. And then we'll give a few results on this, some systems we've been building as uh, examples. So to start with, uh, we've got uh, our machine learning frameworks and everybody here probably knows about them. Um, you know, the open source frameworks, uh, industry platforms. And again, we're working on FPGA, so that's why these are in here. And then if you look at what these different frameworks offer, um, we like to think, well, depends on who you ask, because again, many researchers are working on different things. Uh, we like to think about it from the perspective of uh, a machine learning stack, uh, such as this. Uh, you'll see um, many kinds of stacks in this uh, presentation were very much into abstraction layers. So in this stack, we'll start at the top and this is maybe where a lot of people you know, that have um, um, been giving talks here are, are starting from, which is applications and algorithms coming up with uh, new ways to use machine learning and new algorithms um, for these different applications. 
The next layer is one that maybe there hasn't been as much uh, work in, but it's how do we uh, kind of connect all of the pieces? And again, uh, remember the focus of our work is on very large scale deployment of uh, systems that are doing machine learning. So if we have a lot of uh, FPGAs, uh, how do we get those FPGAs connected together? What's the best way to do that? Uh, what protocols work best. And finally, again, uh, at the hardware level, you know, we can work on different circuits. How many multipliers are we going to use? What kind of memory architecture uh, do we want? And things like that. So all of these uh, layers uh, with this abstraction, uh, we'd like researchers to be able to kind of pick the layers that they're interested in and work on those. So this gets us to a GN. And so the in my group, the sort of our last big project uh, is called Galapagos and uh, continuing with the theme of archipelago. So we came up with a GN as pronounced uh, like the sea, uh, but basically since it's machine learning, we and a little play on the, on the spelling. So a GN is two frameworks that I'll talk about shortly, one that generates IP cores and one that allows us to, to deploy multiple FPGAs applications. So HLS 4ML is the, the uh, machine learning part of this project. It's developed by a bunch of physicists. And if you remember the title page, there were a lot of names. So whenever you work with physicists, there are a lot of authors on the projects. So it's an open source project where the idea is that I provide as input, uh, originally with HLS for ML, it was provide as input a description of the FPGA, or at least the resources that you want to use and a description of the neural net that you want to implement. And the output is synthesizable C++ code, so HLS, that's the HLS part, that uh, will generate a circuit that fits it within the resource constraints um, that you want. You have a few uh, limited knobs available that you can use to tune the HLS code to make things fit in the FPGA. Now, part of this AGN project was to uh, modify HLS 4ML so that it wasn't just targeting a single FPGA, but it actually could spit out the different layers of the network that you wanted to build. And uh, you can think about what we're providing here as a target is a very, very large FPGA. So the other part was Galapagos and Galapagos uh, is a heterogeneous uh, stack as you see on the right there. Um, it allows users to create um, heterogeneous clusters of applications. So meaning we can have parts of the application running on CPUs, part of it running on FPGAs and that's all transparent to the user. So by doing that, we can actually, in our particular case, um, we can generate HLS uh, C++ code and run them as software kernels on CPUs connected in the network that we will uh, eventually be running on FPGAs. And we can then um, actually say, okay, now um, we'll start with say, seven kernels running on seven different CPUs. And uh, then to say, okay, on um, uh, CPUs three and four, now convert them to run on FPGAs. And that can be done seamlessly um, to the, for the user. They don't have to change their code. And also uh, because the, the, we have a communications layer that's abstracted and that allows uh, people in my group to uh, work on the underlying uh, different communication protocols. We can run exactly the same applications on top without any change at the application layer. Uh, we 
currently have TCP and UDP uh, and uh, layer um, one ethernet protocols that we can do. And we're also currently doing a project to look at uh, uh, advanced data center architectures where we're running our own custom layer one protocols. But again, we can use exactly the same applications. The applications are agnostic. So uh, AGN was really, um, again, created to allow um, HLS formal to generate circuits on much you know, sort of um, virtual gigantic, gigantic FPGAs. And uh, so HLS formal uh, generates the IP cores, Galapagos gives us the multi FPGA fabric. And the combination of the tool is a GM that allows us to uh, deploy very large neural nets on multiple FPGAs. And another way as you're listening to this talk is to realize um, the ML layer is actually a light, an application layer. And if you want to work in some other space that requires multiple FPGAs, um, this shows you how to do that. So with the uh, Aegean tool flow, we'll work through all of this and you'll see where uh, the different layers are. But this entire tool flow is automated meaning you can basically start at the front end, push a button and get bit streams out at the later end. Okay, so just kind of going through the front end is your typical um, ML tools that um, the data scientists would be working with. The next layer, we take those and input whatever model you want to uh, develop and uh, put it into HLS for ML, which will generate one IP core per layer tuned for a particular output uh, or particular throughput requirement that you specify. Uh, we also output up here, you'll see something about bridges and I'll go to the next slide and explain what that is uh, shortly in a second. Anyways, this particular HLS for ML step uh, can take uh, several hours. And that's because we're doing out of context place and route here to get an estimate of the resource use for each of the layers. So um, yeah, so there's these bridges here. And what I, that means is, uh, is explained in this picture. Um, Galapagos itself was originally designed to connect kernels. So this um, large box here is a Galapagos kernel and the kernels are specified to have an input stream and a single output stream. Inside here, now that we're adding HLS for ML are the ML layers and this picture we're saying put two of those inside one FPGA. So they have to be packed into a kernel and then we have to wrap those kernels with uh, these bridges uh, to adhere to sort of Galapagos protocol on the outside and HLS for ML protocol on the inside. And one of the reasons we ended up needing to do this was that the HLS for ML kernels have one stream or channel per dimension and so we might have, in some cases, 1,024 different streams here that have to be uh, connected together uh, between the cores. And if we're going on or off the chip, we have to combine those streams into the single Galapagos stream. Again, this is all fully automated. The next step is uh, a partitioner. And this is, again, a, a layer that we can build uh, new partitioners. The first one we built is fairly simple. Uh, it will just look at the layers and bridges uh, that are generated uh, and uh, basically in a greedy manner allocate them to FPGAs or pack FPGAs up to a limit of 80% of uh, whatever resource uh, is um, sort of 
the maximum use there. So we don't want to pack more than 80% uh, utilization. And this step takes on the order of just a few seconds. Um, and, and remember in, in this step back here, we have the data from before where we know the large, how much uh, resources each of the layers is using. Uh, the final part takes um, the output from the partitioner that's specified how all the layers should be packed and then packs them into uh, the FPGAs, adds all of the communications and networking hardware and generates the final bit stream. Again, this is all automated. So this, because we're doing uh, place and route, can take several hours uh, to do. And it's in, in the example, you'll see it's several hours per FPGA. Although the argument that it is if I have a data center, I can fire off all of those in parallel. So the idea here is there are a lot of steps, but it's also mostly abstracted away. And depending on what you want to work on, what's your domain expertise, um, you can attack um, this stack at, in different levels. And so here is where we talk about uh, design space exploration. And I'll just go through and show uh, what different perspectives are. If you're a data scientist, really you just want this. You want to play with your uh, tensor flow at the end and just get some bit streams at the end uh, to test out how it runs. Uh, if you're an IP core designer, it looks like this. I will input uh, models and then play around with this layer in here that generates the IP cores. That can be anywhere from playing with HLS for ML itself or coming up with your own way to generate IP cores. And if I'm the data center architect, which is where a lot of my group is working, uh, we are just looking for applications. So we generate these applications and play around at the back end with the communications layers, uh, partitioning, and how we map things into a data center. So quickly, with some results, um, we have a, our own mini data center with a bunch of CPUs. Uh, in particular, we have a lot of FPGAs. Um, this picture shows a chassis which is now fully populated with uh, 16 of these FIDUS Sidewinder MP SUC boards. And they're all connected to through 100 gigabit uh, network um, interfaces. Um, just a little bit about um, how this system is working. You can see in terms of latency and throughput, if we're connecting software to hardware, it doesn't work that well. Um, there is some software tuning that we know we can do that we haven't worried about. More importantly, the FPGA to FPGA has very, very low latency and gets a full bandwidth through the network. And um, the, again, talking to uh, software, um, hardware to software, the throughput numbers we can't get because the software can't keep up with the hardware. We've been working on uh, ResNet 50. We have two configurations that run at 660 images per second, batch one. This was designed just to beat uh, the Microsoft Brainway, Brainwave implementation, and we're working up on uh, much faster versions for the next paper. But uh, just to point out, we first started with a version that took 12 FPGAs, found a bug in how the DSPs were being allocated in HLS for ML, made that uh, three line fix in HLS for ML, push the button and have nine FPGAs. Uh, I talked quickly about resource utilization. You can see that the early FPGAs are DSP limited and the later ones where the dimensions start to increase are lot limited. And so you can see how our partitioning algorithm is working. So just very quickly in summary, we've got this tool flow. We can generate multi FPGA and CPU neural networks uh, using HLS for ML and 
Galapagos. You can do tuning of the IP cores uh, in the communication. Um, these cores can then be deployed onto FPGAs and CPUs. And again, we can play with the communication layer. So finally, in con conclusion, uh, we have network connected FPGAs, um, which is a much more scalable approach than using traditional PCI Express. Um, we envision sort of at data center level of scaling to um, you know, hundreds or thousands of FPGAs. Um, and we can actually, by doing this, create much larger fabrics, uh, opening the door for more complex algorithms and the opportunity to explore much larger uh, multi FPGA ML systems. And that's where we're going to go next. Thank you. We are on schedule and we will move to our next presenter. Pavel Sinha. So please uh, share your desktop. <clears throat> so Pavel uh, has over 10 years uh, of industry R&D experience. Uh, he worked previously in different R&D uh, senior position at Qualcomm and Cadence. Currently he is a PhD candidate at uh, McGill University, Montreal, uh, with specialization in artificial intelligence, machine learning and VLSI. Uh, his PhD work has resulted in a startup called Arish Technology, uh, where he is a CEO and uh, he is developing high performance, low power and low cost artificial intelligence accelerators. Uh, so Pavel is presenting today a low power AI system design uh, that delivers the ultimate power optimized solution resulting from a synergy that optimizes hardware, algorithm and the overall system simultaneously. Thanks, Yasin, for uh, such a good uh, introduction. Um, I think my screen is now visible. Yes. Okay, it's full screen. So um, thanks uh, everyone and um, uh, welcome to this presentation. Um, you know, as Yasin uh, said, um, it's a small presentation on uh, low power AI system design and uh, I'm presenting from Arish Technologies. Uh, we are an incorporated uh, startup here in Montreal. Topics of discussion today, uh, I'll give a brief introduction to Arish, uh, the market opportunity this segment has, um, and then follow with uh, certain uh, methodical um, optimization approaches from system level, uh, algorithm level, and then processor level. Um, followed by some of the work we've done in that, um, in the processor level, in the IDE development plus emulation, and then um, a, a raw to rec uh, a system level optimization that we have worked on. Um, I thought this might um, interest a lot of people. And, uh, and then concluding from there. So who we are, we are Irish Technologies. Um, what do we do? Um, you know, we develop, uh, we help our clients uh, develop AI systems, especially targeting low power systems. Uh, some of the uh, clients that you're working with right now are uh, systems like uh, lip to audio in-store analysis, uh, even COVID analysis, um, and for manufacturing, especially uh, quality control uh, analysis. And, um, um, you know, some of the parameters that are that we always end up considering, uh, they end up being cost, capacity, battery life, and security has become a new feature. Um, earlier, or even most processes today, uh, security is not a concern, but it's more and more in these kind of applications, uh, we're seeing that uh, security is becoming a, a major concern. And uh, to speak about the overall market opportunity of this space, it's significant. Um, it's projected in, in over 35 billion, this whole space. And the specific space of just low power is projected to be over 4 billion plus. Um, and a market share that you can see, and this doesn't include the defense sector. So it's, it's a big market opportunity that is there and it's just emerging into that space. Now, going over some of the um, challenges we face in, a, in system level design, 
And I thought maybe it would be good to kind of list that. Uh, so as we all know, most of the optimization is really there in the algorithm level. So start off with the uh, algorithm level optimization, but before even you get there, the first step is to get your data uh, because you are targeting a specific application and having a good data set is the key. Otherwise you'll end up, uh, you know, getting a, a accuracy of, of over 95% in your um, data set you have, but you go into the real field, it drops by 25%. You, we've seen that all the time. So having a realistic data set, you start off with that. And then your CNN training and optimization, the algorithm optimization, where uh, most of the cases you have room for up to 70% of, uh, of computational optimization. Um, and um, depending on application, um, in the industry at least what we notice is that most people just end up using CNNs like a black box and just take a model and run it. But when you optimize it, you can, you can significantly optimize it. And then comes the steps of uh, mapping onto, and you can have hardware specific uh, graph optimizations of your CNN. Um, and then you pick the hardware you want to run on. That becomes very critical because that can have up to 10x impact on power. Um, you know, on a similar class of processors, if you pick um, a processor can give up to 10x improvement. Uh, you know, the picture shows some of the applications we target. So the coming to the algorithm level optimization, actually I did present this last year um, at uh, I think it was in March last year. Um, so I won't go over it much, but it's, uh, it's, an all, it's uh, one of the methods of algorithm optimization. There are several in the literature. This is the subband based optimization where an input is first broken into subbands and then a smaller parallel CNNs uh, process the image and that's trained together and um, you get good performance out of it. You can see uh, the parameter reduction uh, and uh, and uh, the top uh, one and five accuracy. Uh, it's pretty good uh, compared to rest. I mean, of course, there are a few which are better uh, in top uh, five accuracy, but uh, in top uh, one accuracy, it's, it's pretty good. Now, coming to the processor level optimization, there is plenty of room there to optimize uh, uh, the processors in the hardware on silicon, um, you can get up to 10x difference in power uh, if power is your concern. Um, we saw the previous uh, presentation where it was performance was, um, and this is a very different space. This is for reducing power. And I've compared some of these um, uh, best in class, uh, I would say processors out there. Um, they're all released in the past, uh, year and a half to two, um, not even two, I guess, mostly year, year and a half. And um, you'll see that uh, to get a very low power, like 20 milliwatt, you can only get up to you know, one, 1 1.5 tops per watt per chip. Uh, actually tops per chip, sorry, not per watt, tops per chip, because that's important. After all, you're gonna have one chip doing the task. So whatever task you intend to do, if um, you don't have enough horsepower, that's not the chip to pick. Uh, now, we've been working on a processor module and it's, um, we should be taping out shortly. So some numbers that I could uh, present. Um, I was presenting more, but then I realized a lot of it, lot of it is under NDA, which I cannot disclose. But um, you know, from our back annotated SDF sims uh, of, of a layout, uh, you know, we can get up to 20 milliwatts. Uh, at about 15 tops per watt. Um, and, uh, you know, a standard YOLO V3 running at 30 frames per second. Um, in terms of security, um, you know, we are implementing the hardware root of trust protocol, um, which can be easily integrated with BIOS um, level systems or, or similar security um, level, um, you know, systems. So that, uh, because uh, more and more applications we are seeing uh, security is a big, big concern. And price, um, you know, uh, going to a 
uh, latest node. Um, in this case, uh, oh yeah, it, I can't mention the node, sorry. Uh, but, um, uh, the, and also in, in volume production, this becomes, um, um, you know, the price decreases drastically. Um, also, the architecture allows for cascading of multiple processes where a big CN, if you have a big CNN, uh, it doesn't need to be fitting into one chip, but you can easily cascade it. And here is an example of an image sensor, um, you know, driving a serial, serially cascaded CNN processes running the application. So that allows you to scale at a chip level instead of, um, you know, inside the chip because that can be expensive in the overall system. Um, we also provide a, a, a IDE platform, we call it IDE plus emulation. Um, IDE is standard IDE. Um, it's an open source uh, platform we took and uh, customized it. And then it can program the hardware, but the emulation part is interesting. So um, the FPG, uh, the, the CNN processor that you'll be running on you can actually emulate that even before running it on the hardware, a full complete emulation. And that emulation, you can also target a, a GPU, a standard GPU. Uh, well, actually right now, uh, we're just supporting the NVIDIA. So in other words, you have the IDE, you have your, uh, um, your application, you have a, you've, you've optimized your CNN, uh, you wanna get the hardware performance. You will actually get it in hardware, uh, bit level accurate hardware performance. And you can accelerate that on a GPU. So that's, uh, you know, turns out to be pretty um, beneficial to uh, some of our clients. And this IDE also allows you to kind of uh, take models that has already been developed in PyTorch, TensorFlow, CAFE, Keras, or even MATLAB and pull it in. And because it just transforms into a graph and we deal with the graph. Now, um, this um, is an interesting uh, application that uh, we've been working on. Um, we've also filed a patent on this. It's basically processing um, raw sensor data directly um, on a CNN. So we call it raw to rec processing, a system level optimization solution, we would say, um, wherein instead of having a standard signal processing, image signal processing pipeline, uh, we just take the raw data and we train it on it so that at runtime, uh, the CNN is just working on the raw image data. Um, now, the question comes, how do you train the model, right? So you need a lot of raw data and um, usually all the data sets available are RGB. So you use a, a generative model to generate it, um, but you also need some ground truth uh, labeled data set. Um, in order to uh, validate what you generated is right, uh, a small validation set. So typically from here, the generative model generate the, uh, you know, the Bayer pattern, and that Bayer pattern would be used to train the raw to rec, uh, the CNN. And I wanted to show some results. This is interesting. This is the, uh, the left is the, I don't know if you can see my mouse. This is the RGB. Um, uh, this is the uh, fake raw, so the generated raw. And using the raw, we uh, regenerate um, the I using the ISP, uh, the the uh, the RGB image. And sorry, and this is the enhanced version of the fake raw. So that because the reason it is dark because Bayer pattern is uh, uh, is one pixel uh, per color. Actually, maybe I should explain that a bit more. So here in this image. Um, uh, you can see that how a Bayer pattern would look like because it has uh, double the amount of green compared to red and blue. Um, and the right, this is the image, which is the RGB that we visually see and can uh, draw it on a monitor. <clears throat> but this has to be processed um, before you can get this uh, processed image. So that's why it's, it's dark. It, it should be, it's intended, but we kind of enhance the contrast to kind of get the details. So this is, uh, you know, uh, image that was generated well. Uh, I think this was done pretty well. Um, uh, because of the generative uh, nature of the CNN, we actually see some details being enhanced. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad. 
um, but we do see these, which is good. I think it's uh, kind of uh, doing, it's learning the ISP better than the um, ISP for the RGB. And then here are some images, which is not so good. And this is probably because of, we don't have much of uh, ocean images and uh, we can see uh, color patterns emerging from there, uh, which is uh, not desirable. Uh, another one, uh, you can see this pattern coming up from the shark. Um, and um, another important thing is uh, in, in uh, real life, um, AI systems, um, you're going to be, your cameras are going to be dealing with high resolution images and you have to downsample it. And if you're dealing with the image before 16, that very low resolution or even 640 by 480 size images and where your cameras are, you know, like 4K, 2K kind of cameras. So you require a lot of downsampling. Then the question is you have so many different kinds of algorithms for downsampling. And then we just did a big study that uh, it actually doesn't matter what algorithm you use. I mean, you do get some um, effect, uh, some hit on performance here. Uh, we see that binning, okay, but binning is such an easy on the hardware. It saves so much of power compared to a bilinear or a Langsos, uh, you know, fifth order Langsos. Um, visually, you do see that the image degrading and you feel it's gonna have a very bad impact on the uh, CNN, but when you train it with it, it doesn't have that much of an impact. You now I understand in academic papers, uh, you know, 2%, 3% is a, but in real life, it doesn't mean much because in the real life, uh, their performances might be very, you know, pretty same. It depends on the uh, data set, right? What you're training on and what you're testing on. Some of our um, uh, partners in this uh, venture we are doing, um, we're working with um, and some um, uh, standardizations uh, and uh, our academic partners as well and our industry partners. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel, very much for your nice presentation. And uh, now we'll remind everyone uh, that this is the last presentation is with Rick O'Connor from Open Hardware Group. So please, Pavel, and share your desktop so Rick can jump in. Uh, so Rick will present uh, a Core 5 course, industrial uh, grade open source Risk 5 enabling AI accelerators at the edge and uh, he will provide an overview of the core five uh, family we, which uh, which is an open hardware group project to develop deploy execute pre-silicon functional verification and SOC based evaluation kits of the core five family of open source risk five cores uh, rick five corner is uh, a proven industry executive with over 25 years of experience across the semiconductor compute and telecom sectors driving open standards-based technology deployments. Rick, you are up. Great, thanks, thanks Yassine. Um, I'm assuming that you can hear me, I'm on the air. I'll go full screen here. Oops. I hear you very well. All right, very good. There we go. All right, uh, thanks for the intro Yassine. Uh, maybe just to set a little bit of context uh, for those of you that, that uh, don't know me. I'm uh, uh, I'm the CEO of the Open Hardware Group, and uh, we'll talk in detail about what that me what that is uh, here in a moment. But prior to start of the Open Hardware Group, I, I was the founder of the Risk Five Foundation with the team at UC Berkeley uh, back in 2014, and I, I ran the uh, open source organization for Risk Five about five years um, when I left and started uh, basically an open source implementation organization uh, here, Open Hardware Group. Uh, so I spent, I spent quite a bit of time traveling the world and, and engaging different uh, ecosystems and, uh, and development uh, communities around RISC-V as an ISA. Um, and you know, one of the one of the most frequent questions I used to get was, "Hey, it's great that that's an open ISA spec. 
uh, please just give me a core um, and give me an open source core. And oh, by the way, make it well verified, written in system Verilog using you know, high commercial grade verification techniques. And that is really the, the catalyst for how and why the Open Hardware Group was created. So Open Hardware Group uh, is a nonprofit, a global organization, federally registered here in Canada and driven by the member community uh, uh, organizations, both academia and commercial, as well as individual contributors uh, to create an environment for hardware and software designers to collaborate in the public domain on the development of open source cores, the related IP to use them, tools, uh, operating systems, and various software. Um, and in particular, this family is that uh, in, the, in this community is branded Core 5. So that's a, that's a roadmap, if you will, of various risk, open source RISC 5 cores. Um, so the, the ecosystem is growing rapidly. Uh, we really are just finishing up our first full year of operations um, uh, as, a, as an open source community. With, and we have an international footprint with developers around the world. And you should really think about this ecosystem as trying to mimic what you'd expect to see from a commercial IP company who offers processor cores uh, you know, as a commercial business. The difference being that this is community developed, supported and maintained. They're open source available to anyone who wants to use them. And clearly there's no, there are no uh, fees associated with using the cores. There's no royalty or anything like that. We have very strong support from industry uh, um, as shown here. We have more than 64, close to, I think it's 66 now. Every time we put the slide up, it's out of date. Uh, members and partners uh, across the ecosystem. This is an example of the industry portion of the ecosystem uh, where we have uh, you know, very significant semiconductor players, uh, systems players, IP companies, tool chain companies, um, large organizations, small organizations, quite a, quite a cross section of participants as well as foundries. Uh, so you know, Global, Global Foundry is a, is a member and participates in the, in the projects that we have. Then on the academic side, where our cores actually came from at ETH Zurich, which I'll talk about in a moment, we have a number of key uh, international institutions and a growing roster of Canadian institutions, which um, part of my experience in growing the RISC V adoption globally was much to my disappointment, we didn't have enough activity here in Canada around RISC V. So, uh, you know, with my Canadian flag stamped on my heart, um, when the opportunity came to create the Open Hardware Group, um, um, and I was asked to do this by a number of key members in the ecosystem, um, I, I basically told them, okay, well, I'll just incorporate in Canada. And, and uh, quite jingoistically, I'm interested in setting up uh, a, a broader adoption uh, of RISC-5 RISC implementations uh, across the, you know, the Canadian schools. On the partner side, we've got a bunch of key uh, partners that help us either with tool chain or, or uh, compute infrastructure, bring, uh, bring these artifacts uh, to the ecosystem. So how, how are we structured? Uh, just briefly, board of directors uh, drives basically two working groups, a technical working group and a marketing working group. And underneath those working groups um, are various task groups. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, top, the technical working group task groups in a moment, uh, but fundamentally they drive the cores themselves, the RTO themselves, the verification of those cores, the tool chain software work to support them and, uh, and IDE work and, and RTOS porting and, and, and so on, as well as hardware implementations, um, both in FPGA emulation environment, as well as uh, full SOC implementations. Um, and we have quite a number of active projects uh, in, the, in the ecosystem uh, across all of those fronts. So as down at the bottom bullet there, you can see uh, very active RTL verification and, and tools work, as I mentioned before, and many more projects in the pipeline. So in the technical working group, this is chaired, you can think of this as the R&D of the organization. Um, and this is chaired by Samas and Ahmed. Uh, from Silicon Labs and Jerry Zink from NXP. 
And it's, it's really the R&D, as I said, our engineering organization department uh, of, the, uh, of the whole ecosystem. And they, this group oversees the projects that are underway in the various task groups that I mentioned earlier. And to make it easier to get up and running, uh, we partnered at the very beginning of creating Open Hardware Group, we partnered with the Eclipse Foundation to leverage their engineering release methodology um, such that we authenticate every contribution with the GitHub ID of the contributor, where it came from, where it's been, who that contributor is, so that we can increase the quality, not, not from a, a bug standpoint, but from an open source cleanliness standpoint, if you will, we can increase the quality of uh, all contributions that come from any contributor, be they an individual or from an academic institution or from a, a corporate uh, contributor. So in the CORS task group, and this is where it starts to get more interesting, we'll talk about some real technology. Uh, which this, this task group is chaired by Ariane Bank from Silicon Labs and Jérôme Guillermo from uh, Talis uh, Research and Technology. And they, what really got us started was the contribution of, of two very popular cores uh, that were developed uh, under Professor Luca Benini's leadership at ETH Zurich, the RISC-E core and the Ariane core. And if you're familiar at all with the RISC-V ecosystem, those names are probably uh, familiar to you. Um, the Open Hardware Group is now um, the committer, if you will. We own the repos, so to speak. No, Everyone owns them and no one owns them, but if, if you will, we are the maintainers. This ecosystem is the maintainers of these cores. And while they had seen silicon many, many times, uh, you know, in various academic projects, they had never been fully verified you know, with a coverage driven UVM methodology that you'd expect to see from commercial IP. And that's part of what the work has been within the, within the open hardware group. So that leads me to the verification task group. And this is chaired by Robert Tu from Futureway and Steve Richmond from Silicon Labs. And this is, this is really where the bulk of the effort is, has been uh, so far in uh, a little over a year of operating where we developed literally a commercial quality best in class verification methodology to verify these open source cores. And if you're a verification, uh, uh, if you have verification interests, uh, you know, this kind of a diagram would be um, familiar to you. We use a uh, step and compare methodology against the Paris uh, UVM based reference model, where at the retire of every instruction that's generated, the program counter uh, CSRs and state of the dot uh, is compared to the reference model. And it makes a big difference from a debug standpoint, um, how to, how to you know, trace bugs uh, back into the source and, and, um, and, and get to bug closure qu more quickly. Uh, so there's a random instruction generator that uh, we leverage from uh, a platform called RISC-5DB from Google that generates uh, random, random code uh, gets pumped into the memory model, and then the, uh, the, the device under test is executing that, that, that code at the same time as the reference model is executing it. And then independent of that, we have UVM agents running to hammer it with interrupts, hammer it with debugs, totally asynchronous to the uh, test program that's been generated to really wring out any, uh, any additional um, bugs that might be there. And as an example, um, the 32-bit uh, is four-stage core, CB32E4, um, that we verified. This is the risky core. We have over, we have 52 bugs that we found in a core that has seen silicon probably about 25 times uh, before we got our hands on it. Um, and the coverage data, this is not typically done, um, and certainly not in commercial environments. The full uh, coverage reports are publicly available on our GitHub repos. You can go and explore for yourself. Uh, these are generated using Jasper, uh, the Jasper tool from Cadence. Um, you can verify for yourself the degree of uh, verification work um, that that's, these cores have seen. So in the software task group, uh, that's led by Jeremy Bennett from Emicosm and Yun Hai Shang from Alibaba. This team is basically, these next two task groups, the software task group and the hardware task group that I'll talk about in a minute, 
these are basically the user community, of the, you know, the output, if you will, of the, of the cores and verification task groups, um, developing, you know, a tool chain um, and operating system ports to support the cores and then boards and SOCs to put them on. So this is a very active group. We have uh, specific IDE work underway for both uh, Eclipse-based IDE environments, as well as platform IO-based IDE environments. Uh, and and uh, the team is, is very active. And on the hardware task group, you know, many of you might know Hugh, Hugh Paul Smith from CMC, um, and Tim Sachs from QuickLogic are the chairs of the hardware task group. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the role here is to support SOC and FPGA based implementations of the cores and various IP that we have within the open hardware group. So in particular, we have, uh, we use uh, digital and um, Xilinx based FPGA boards, uh, both the Nexus 7 and the Genesis 2. We like the Genesis 2 because it's big enough for uh, obviously for the smaller core, but also for uh, multi-core instances of the 64-bit uh, application processor, Ariane, which we call CV64A6. And I'll talk about that more in the context of a vector project in a second. The 32-bit core uh, is being put into uh, uh, Core 5 MCU, uh, which is an SOC that we'll tape out second half of this year. CMC is actually doing the physical design back end um, in, into GF as part of uh, their, their role in the open hardware group. And the intent here is that this will be a, a development platform that we can seed into any number of schools um, and the developer community overall. We'll build between 1,000 and 10,000 units um, and sell them basically at a small markup cost recovery kind of uh, environment. Um, and the cool thing about this chip is it's got an embedded FPGA array that sits alongside uh, the, the Core 5 core um, from QuickLogic. Now that is commercial IP that's not being open sourced, but it will at least provide the opportunity to play with different uh, accelerators and algorithms that you want to uh, explore sitting alongside an open source RISC five implementation. So with that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about a project called Open Hardware Accelerate, or a, a first Open Hardware Accelerate, not a project, but a funding initiative, and then talk about the first project that we've awarded under Open Hardware Accelerate. So this is, a, this is an interesting funding project uh, together with MyTax, supported by MyTax, where um, we've been awarded $22.5 million uh, into Open Hardware Group to uh, fund um, research initiatives supporting open source implementations and research around various architectures and domain space exploration. It doesn't have to be RISC-V, it can be any, anything related to um, uh, embedded IoT, 5G, uh, AI and ML applications, autonomous, autonomous uh, vehicles and, and uh, functional safety kind of applications and security applications. So there's a fairly broad scope of the end, app, end you know, uh, target application of the, of the research that we can fund. And the way this works is it's um, co-opted dollars with an industry sponsor. And I'll be able to show an example of that in a moment. And it's also, uh, we have international um, permission uh, with this as well, where we, part of the uh, initiative is to fund research that is collaborative with other international schools. So 75% of each dollar we get, actually it's about two thirds to 75% uh, of each dollar that we get from the uh, federal government uh, can go towards, needs to go towards a Canadian school. And then the other quarter to one third can go towards an international partner. And I'll show an example of that in a moment. And this open hardware accelerate uh, funding project, uh, our funding initiative is managed within our marketing and working group um, and a university outreach task group that is co-chaired by Mel Char at MyTax and, and Hugh Paul Smith at CMC. And this task group, you know, has an established project approval process and we maintain a, a peer review committee drawing on other academics and industry subject matter experts to review new project proposals and then ultimately uh, recommend them for approval uh, within the MyTax system. 
So it's a novel, novel uh, research funding opportunity where we hope to create better bridges internationally as well as uh, commercially with industrial sponsors. And just uh, a month ago or so, we announced the award of the first project under the Open Hardware Accelerate program. And it's a joint research initiative between the, the very good team under Yvon Savaria at uh, Polytechnique Montréal. And I think you heard from Hossein earlier today uh, uh, during, the, during this talk, these, these talks, as well as uh, the, the team at ETH Zurich uh, under Luca Bidini and Frank Arkenyak, um, where they'll be taking an existing uh, design of a vector processor um, and modifying it and uh, for uh, for additional efficiencies in research uh, with different bit bit widths uh, for uh, sensor data processing and machine learning. So what this looks like is leveraging the 64-bit core that I mentioned earlier, Ariane, which we call a CBA6. This is a six-stage single issue in order core. Uh, that's basically capable of running SMP Linux in a multi-core uh, cluster. Uh, the, uh, this core is within the open hardware group now and is being maintained and, and uh, verified by the open hardware group. You can bring it up on the Genesis 2 platform. You shouldn't think of it as a soft core. This is a SOC targeted RTL, uh, but we, you know, we bring these things up, bring these up on uh, in FPGA environments as an emulation environment. And you can bring it, like I said, you can bring it up in an SMP environment, um, you know, boot, boot Linux and, uh, and explore the performance of these cores. And as a, uh, this accelerator, the ARA accelerator from ETH Zurich, um, stitches in at the instruction decode stage of the pipe uh, of the CVA6 and is a companion accelerator to that process. And it implements the original design was, was developed while the RISC-5 vector extension was in draft state, um, the point set, 0 0.7 state. Uh, so there's been work done to bring the core up to the current state of the draft spec, which is still a draft spec and not released, the 0 0.9 release. And there's other optimizations to be done uh, to the core, which will be part of the, part of the work between Polytechnique Montréal and uh, the team at ETH Zurich. So here's just a quick block diagram of what Arian looks like connected to an accelerator. And the, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a tightly coupled accelerator that stitches right into the instruction decode. And, and when, a, when a vector instruction is, is seen in the, in the decode stage, um, it is claimed and passed off to the, uh, to the vector accelerator. So, that's the end of my overview. Um, you know, very interested in learning um, about any projects that you might have um, that you think would be appropriate for the Open Hardware Accelerate funding initiative. Um, and uh, if you have interest in using RISC-V cores in your work, uh, well, as I said, the open, the open Hardware Group core is the Core 5 family. They're completely open source. And the program that we have with CMC Microsystems, uh, there is no cost for any Canadian university to be a member of the Open Hardware Group and participate in the projects that we have and take advantage of all of the infrastructure around these open source cores. And that's the end of my talk, Yassine. Thank you very much, Rick, for uh, all these details. And thank you for playing a key role in uh, uh, Risk Five uh, in Canada and helping researchers uh, in this space. Um, I think I will bring up uh, the agenda and uh, I will invite uh, speakers to join the panel. So let me just... and share... Okay, I will share my desktop screen one. All right, so... This is, uh, this is the agenda and uh, Rick uh, presented his, uh, the last talk of today. Um, it was really a great workshop with uh, different presentations and the level of details and quality was, was very high. We, we learned a lot from, from this workshop. 
And uh, now we are going to uh, have a panel session where I uh, encourage everyone to participate by asking questions either on the chat window or just unmute yourself and ask questions to the to the presenters. So just setting the stage for the this uh, panel session. So as you know, CMC uh, is uh, is uh, playing a role is uh, is uh, helping researchers uh, throughout their AI development journey, and uh, we 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 have this uh, this uh, infrastructure. Uh, to enable research in this space, uh, basically helping researchers to easily deploy, uh, build, uh, optimize, and deploy their uh, uh, AI solution either in the cloud or at the edge. And we offer uh, a wide variety of uh, of tools and uh, and hardware accelerators from CPUs, GPUs, uh, FPGAs, custom accelerators, and quantum uh, computing. And we have uh, all the frameworks available on these uh, on these platforms. And uh, what I would like to ask uh, our presenter today is, uh, is a general question, is uh, how CMC can help. So what do you see as the most important challenges and opportunities in cloud and edge computing? So this is a very broad question, but uh, I would like it uh, to be toward the infrastructure, toward uh, how CMC can help uh, researchers across Canada. And so I, I will uh, I will go uh, from one speaker to another, and uh, please take uh, three to five minutes to answer the question, and then we will take uh, questions from the audience. Thank you very much. So why we don't start with uh, George? You are my my first in the list. <laughs> Your audio is a little bit low. How about now? Perfect. Okay. Um, so I think one of one of the cases is in our in our scenario. Um, we we would like or we are already using CMC services for uh, offloading lots of data that we're collecting uh, in the various projects and trying to see which algorithms, which machine learning algorithms will help us best extract uh, the features or extract the, the data that we're after from the collected data sets that we already are acquiring. Uh, to give you an example in the automotive applications that we've looked into, so we have now data within a vehicle. We, we know exactly what was the heart rate, breathing rate of every passenger uh, during the test times. Uh, we're trying to see if there is any way we can use machine learning to extract these metrics from the data uh, that we have collected. So uh, the capability of training a very extensive amount of data <laughs> Uh, is is really uh, a huge thing that we are we're looking for at this point. Uh, Rick. All right. Um, yeah, from my standpoint, you know, the, the part of the problem that we're trying to solve in the open hardware community and CMC is already engaged in this. So I don't know that it's something new that you need to do or just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, is around making it easy for um, uh, researchers to take advantage of fundamental building blocks and infrastructure, um, the, the, the you know, sort of the unresearched part uh, of, of the infrastructure that they need to have in place, tool chains, processors they can take apart if they need to, um, uh, and, and, and that work and are um, known, known good in an FPGA flow or even in an SOC flow and have been silicon proven so that the, there's no time wasted on the stuff everybody needs and all of the focus of the small research team can be on the research aspect of what they're trying to work on as opposed to the, you know, sort of the plumbing and infrastructure around building an embedded device, you know, an edge, an edge focused device that might, might have some very interesting algorithms for the sensor processing that is the focus of the research, but the rest of the you know, controller aspect of that edge focus device can can easily be shared across across the whole uh, of our research infrastructure in, in Canada that you support. I know Pavel. You are muted. Okay. Yes. I, so, I had a question. Yeah. Um, um, yes, and that was um, for uh, maybe towards CMC and Rick as well. Um, and uh, you know, we are also using the RISC V, uh, uh, you know, processor, and uh, very familiar with the uh, 
open source community of risk five. Um, actually this question will come as a, a small um, a startup and also as a student. Um, the problem happens in a, in a SOC system, you have multiple IPs, right? Um, you have to get data into the system, data out. Um, so uh, any of the standard IPs, be it USB, PCIe, or uh, MIPI, these IPs are very expensive. So even if my core, let's say a RISC-V is open source, and there are multiple versions of open source uh, available out there, uh, it fully doesn't solve the problem. Uh, how do we deal with this? Uh, these IPs that are there? And... Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll rest my question there. So yeah, so I, I, have, a, I have a pretty strong opinion about that actually. <laughs> um, you know, as an open source community, we have a, a long way to go, right? To, uh, uh, to you know, to crack that nut. Um, and if you think about some of the initiatives that are underway, the challenge of having an open source uh, hardware implementation right from the, you know, the physics at the, at, at, in the foundry at the deep submicron geometry nodes, um, right through the libraries, uh, you know, that support those uh, with, with the PDKs and then the, the IP blocks for the peripherals and the uncore stuff. You write about, great, you're doing an open source core, but the uncore stuff can, you know, uh, cause, cause a lot of challenges. Uh, break through the tool chains uh, for physical design and synthesis and synthesis and verification. And you just keep right on going. And you can convince yourself, you can wrap yourself around the axle and convince yourself this is never going to fly. And part of the challenge that we have is, you know, to sort of take a look at some of the, the travel uh, of our, of our uh, software colleagues had 20 years ago at the beginning of open source software, where today, uh, you know, there's, there's no question about it. You don't get laughed out of the room to suggest you're going to use, you know, an open Linux distribution in your server platform or whatever, right? It's 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 like you'd be crazy not to. Um, so, from an ecosystem enablement standpoint, trying to boil—I I use this analogy all the time—trying to boil the ocean with a single match and believe that we're going to solve all the problems that are all, all of the challenges that I mentioned in that hardware stack, you know, that's not gonna happen out of, uh, uh, you know, anytime soon, this quarter or next, uh, or next year for that matter. Um, and the approach, uh, the pragmatic approach that we're trying to take is some of the fundamental building blocks that everybody has in their MCUs anyway, uh, like say a Cortex M4, if everybody's got a Cortex M4, that's clearly not differentiating, but that control process there's very much needed to enable some of the other things that are happening in, in that infrastructure. And FPGAs can solve a lot of the problem uh, as well from the standpoint that the peripherals are there. So if you think about a headless SOC in an FPGA flow, the peripheral IP is often there in the library and available for you to use. It might even be hard, hardened into the FPGA. So you can still have a fair amount of uh, playing and then part of bringing together an ecosystem like Open Hardware Group is some of the commercial vendors, many of the commercial vendors are interested in participating and helping to support different architectures and implementations that arguably will use their commercial IP. Uh, but it's like, it's that thin edge of the wedge, uh, you know, as the industry learns what an open hardware um, model adoption model is really going to look like. So the, the example that I gave with the core five MCU, where there's commercial embedded FPGA array in, inside, you know, inside this device that we're going to put in developers hands. Um, you know, that, that's a, that's a contribution from, you know, that, that corporation, same with GF, right? They're, they're contributing the 22 FTX node starts for us. Uh, as part of their member contribution. They're not open sourcing the PDK. They're not clearly not open sourcing libraries and all those things, but they're helping to enable, bring more enablement to open source implementations. So it's it's really not a, a, a function of uh, everything has to be open source or, not, or, or as a result, nothing is. Uh, I, I think we really need to have a pragmatic approach and chip away at it. Um, and the 
the advent of an open, free and open ISA is really a key enabler to, to let the ecosystem collaborate around open source implementations. And part of the challenge that we've got right now, to your point that you made, Pavel, is there's lots of open source RISC V cores. That's a good thing uh, from an innovation standpoint and a freedom of action standpoint. And that's a really bad thing from a critical mass and support and longer term viability. Um, but even with Linux, what, there's five uh, distributions that matter. Um, and, and that's it. 20 years ago, there was a lot more uh, that were being developed. And we need to get to that sort of critical mass, um, you know, uh, support around a handful of implementations at various price performance points, if you will, or, or power performance points uh, that everybody just uses as the de facto implementations. That's what we're trying to do at Omar Group. Paul. What do you think is the most important challenges and opportunities in cloud and edge computing and how CMC can help in this space? Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm probably more the cloud person and um, the rest of the, I think this group is not quite, the, is not operating at a different level. I think um, from the cloud perspective, I think things are changing in and things have to change in the architecture of the data centers to fully kind of leverage the power of FPGAs. Um, currently, the most common model is an FPGA plugged into uh, a, a server chassis. Um, the data centers are wanting to go more disaggregated, meaning there'll just be pools of uh, resources, so pools of GPUs, pools of CPUs, even pools of memory and storage. Storage is already kind of disaggregated. Um, and then along with that has to be all the infrastructure to make it easy for people to program these devices. Um, it's still not there yet. There's a lot of work on high level synthesis and tools like that, which is good, but uh, that doesn't, help you actually deploy things onto a, uh, a, a bunch of networked FPGAs. You need a lot more infrastructure to make that uh, more transparent. Um, I'm not sure what CMC can do for this. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, Griffin, can you give us your perspective? Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of the biggest challenges that we're facing have to do with scale and not the least of which are these ideas of you know, ever since attention, the concept of attention and transformers were, were popularized in deep learning. We're now, I know NVIDIA at least is thinking of, you know, by 2023 training models on the order of a hundred trillion parameters. And, I, and, and Paul made a really great point. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it from a, a GPU perspective in place of an FPGA perspective. But I think the, the way that CMC can help is, is, is getting people access to, to infrastructure that's designed with, you know, with, with GPUs in mind, with AI in mind. And that means not only just getting access to maybe a, an A100 or I know you have V100s today, but getting access to machines with with many of those uh, GPUs that are, are tightly coupled in, in perhaps the in interconnect they use. And then moreover down the line, um, integration with things like data processing units, DPUs, um, getting people programming on, on DACA and DPUs in the same way they'd be programming on CUDA with GPUs. And then further down the line, things like, uh, like Grace for, for tighter coupling with, with CPU memory. Um, in addition to the way that DPUs will access tighter coupling with, with data, and then, you know, to the end of, of, of software, getting more people using um, SDKs like QQuantum for, for GPU accelerated quantum simulation. I, I think it's sort of a full, a full stack problem. And I think a lot of the solutions will lie in, you know, the greater number of developers and, and community contributors we can have addressing these challenges. Thank you. Uh, I will encourage everyone uh, from the attendees to unmute your mic and ask any question to any presenter. And we have uh, already uh, someone who wants to ask a question is Francois Ludic. Please jump in, Francois. 
Yes, thanks. Um, so, yeah, so I actually had a related question to what Pavel was asking about the, the open source ecosystem. So my the questions primarily, I guess, for, for Rick and for CMC as well. So um, Rick, you, you mentioned this uh, initiative that sounds very interesting, uh, the MyTax initiative, uh, where we can propose projects that have some international component. And um, that, that made me think there's, there's one um, a potential hurdle there when, when doing these international collaborations, especially if we want to bring in some kind of ASIC component, as you mentioned, with maybe with some backend design and so on, is that typically the licenses for the tools are pretty restrictive, uh, access for the technology as well. So I was wondering if you've thought about, uh, or if you've thought of ways if for these projects to, to facilitate having people from uh, not only Canada, but also other countries collaborate on the same uh, chip project. Yeah, for sure. So the the um, that example that I gave with Polytechnique Montreal and, and ETH Zurich, that will go to Silicon and 22FDX. Um, and the back end uh, will be done by CMC and, and Global. Um, and, and in particular, uh, I should draw another distinction. So generally, all of the big EDA guys offer academic licenses for their tools right into the institutions and CMC supports you know, the network across Canada with that. Um, Cadence is our CAD partner and we have full commercial licenses in the open hardware group. Uh, so we have, mm -hmm. we have staff um, uh, within the open hardware group, not as, we don't, we don't create new projects. Uh, the members decide what the projects are and, and our engineering staff supports them. Um, and for uh, layouts um, and, and chip designs, that will be done as open hardware group projects. Uh, they will use the commercial tools. Uh, so the end device doesn't have the same restrictions, if you will, that, that the devices would have, you know, from a academically licensed uh, version of the tools as an example. So the part of the, part of what we're trying to create or what we have created within the open hardware group is in, in fact sol solving that problem for us while bringing Foundry partners to the table with commercial companies who want to support the creation of, you know, not production volume, but limited deployment, early, uh, early volume, but beyond, you know, a dozen prototypes, uh, but it's a limited deployment, thousand to 10,000 kind of units into the developer community, just to take things that much further than, you know, a, a basic proof of concept bring up. Okay, so, so does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, more or less, but I'm still wondering if, if there would be agreements in place for, for instance, with Cadence, because uh, we're told uh, these days that, uh, um, you know, we're not allowed to allow people outside of Canada, say, to work on, to, to use, uh, say, Cadence licenses that are offered by CMC and things like that, uh, or, or, or to have them sign this, the same uh, NDAs, you know, for the technologies that we're using. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to bring in, like, say, an engineer that's from the ETH Zurich, for example, and have him uh, work directly on the back end? Um, yeah. So, and that you know that that's part of the problem that we're trying to overcome, right? So, generally, each of the institutions have their own tools, and they you know work with those tools. And for uh, specific implementations, like I mentioned earlier, that you know are going to be an open hardware group tape out, if you will. Right, they'll, they'll go through the commercial tools. Uh, the support that we get from the EDA companies, like you said, is not, you know, we're not at liberty to distribute those licenses around the world, right? They're, they're for our use. Um, um, but, you know, the fact that we've got this many um, parts of that, you know, challenging, uh, you know, hardware stack, uh, this many contributors uh, to the table engaged in what, what is clearly open source projects um, means that there's, you know, they have, there's a willingness for them to, uh, to figure out how to support the projects that we bring forward. So, you know, I, without, without, you know, getting in now on, on the specific details of your project, you know, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. What school are you with? A polytechnic. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> well, you can talk to Yvo and JP. Yeah, exactly. I, I could talk to Yvo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, all, it's all good. <laughs> all right. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, merci, All right, uh, dear guests, you 
don't be shy, jump in, uh, and mute your, your microphone and ask questions if you need to. Hi, Yassine. It's Peter. This is Peter, yes. Hey. Hi. Wonderful workshop, by the way. Very interesting talks all, all afternoon since so one o'clock. I, I just wanted to sort of make a mention of the unique position that CMC offers to researchers who connect with the organization, that is to make chips. Um, so certainly software is important, certainly FPGAs are key, certainly prototyping systems by buying off the shelf parts are, are important. But if uh, somebody's interested in differentiating themselves in terms of their research or what their company is doing, we can make custom chips as we heard Rick describe in uh, great detail, some of the uh, projects we're involved in. Um, <laughs> so that's the statement. The sort of question is, um, are there any questions around that? Do those in this uh, uh, workshop this afternoon believe that's an important differentiator? Uh, if there's something specific we could do around that beyond what we've described <laughs> in terms of the open source cores and all that other activity, um, we'd be interested, thanks. Uh, thank I you, Peter. Add to that, like, uh, if I may. Yes. So the, the project that the uh, Open Hardware proposed and CMC sponsored uh, uh, with the uh, partnership with ETH, actually this uh, 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 service that CMC provides was very appealing to you know, our friends in ETH because uh, they would actually mention that if we had this service, we'd you know, tape out every single project that we have in, uh, even for our master's students. So right. I think it's a very important uh, that um, universities and uh, uh, I don't know, like supervisors know about the service and uh, get uh, whatever they need from CMC to know that it's a very valuable service that we have in Canada. Right, okay. Okay, for uh, Peter and uh, and Rick and those uh, concerned about IP, here's just an idea to throw out. Um, like just like you do with uh, tools and getting kind of academic licenses, can um, there are a lot of IP cores that are pretty critical now if anybody's going to build a chip. Um, you know, so CERTES, uh, PCIe on top of that, things like that. Can CMC negotiate academic licenses for some of these cores so that people can prototype an interesting chip? And of course, down the road, the if they are successful, then whoever gave you that uh, academic license could reap big rewards if somebody actually shows some success. Now, they, they're not gonna to wanna to do that and spend a lot of time on support. Um, so maybe that's where um, CMC comes in. Yeah, Paul, you, you're, you're bang on. And I mean, that's kind of what's happened so far with our relationship with GF and the library support and even the commercial IP from QuickLogic for that embedded FPGA array that's gonna go into the MCU. But you know things like DDR4 memory controllers, and you know, there's a there's a whole raft of key enablement, uh, you know, uh, IP. So the you know the early the early formation of Open Hardware Group, uh, you know, some of those guys were interested, kind of wanted to see how this was going to play out. You know, clearly we've got 65 members and partners at the table. There's more and more momentum and interesting projects. The funding that we got with through MyTax. So there's a bunch of interesting um, you know, sort of projects on the horizon. And it, that is in fact the plan. That's the intent to get the, some of these commercial companies to participate, uh, let, lend us their IP, if you will, uh, with clear you know, production limits, uh, quantity limits and so on. And it's, it's, they're really just you know, walking, talking demos, uh, if you will, for, for, the, for their capability. And if, anyone wants to commercialize, they've got to go knock on the door and, and negotiate their agreement. So we don't have anything to announce like that right now, but you know that's absolutely the direction that we're trying to take the ecosystem in. And 
part of the, part of building is an ecosystem is making sure all the cool kids, you know, stop standing on the side of the gymnasium and they actually come into the middle of the dance floor and they dance. So, you know, the more participation that we can get uh, across the country from each of, you know, the, the institutions that are on the, on the call, the, the bigger critical mass that we build and influence that we can have over some of these commercial companies where they'll, they'll want to come and participate. Thanks, Rick. Thank, thanks, Paul, for that. That's a great Actually, idea. Yes, and if I can add to that what uh, Professor Paul Chow said, um, we actually had CMC uh, helping us with uh, one of the IPs with MIPI uh, without naming the vendor. Uh, we had a lot of discussions, but it did not pan out. They did not. So what they said is these IPs are very critical to them and uh, they would not want to give it out for research. So we had to literally find funding for getting those IPs. Yeah. Actually, it was just one IP, but yeah. Yeah, they're the crown jewels for a lot of these IP companies, and they also are easy to steal or misuse or misplace or inadvertently make available, and that scares them. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, so that's another place that maybe CMC can firewall these things where um, CMC holds the IP. Right. And it doesn't get to the universities. What happens is the universities you know, put in a hole, you give them a black box or something yeah. um, for the, and you just plop in the, uh, the IP at, at the last step. Yeah. So here's a, here's a, a, a thought that, or an idea that is percolating inside the open hardware group that it is even more secure than that, right? We, we collaborate almost commercially on, on a headless SOC, if you will, uh, use leverage chiplet technology carve out the actual compute cluster um, and accelerator arrays and everything. There's nothing in there except for the uncore, or if you will, uh, just the peripherals. And then, and produce that and just have it as a, as a base wafer or, or I don't know what you we'd call it, but a base substrate, I mean, it's not really a substrate, but you, you know what I mean? A base SSC that has no compute capacity. It's a peripheral uh, you know, landing site and leverage chiplet, chiplet technology and reuse that landing site over and over again and with various configurations of accelerators and, and coherent clusters and you know, different uh, compute experiments that, that we want to uh, want to exercise. That sounds like so, really so we should do it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's not for the fate of art, uh, and not the least of which is just the, the negotiating part to get the right people to the table but yeah we need to we need to go and influence that and make that happen i think uh, what professor paul Chow said i think if cmc approaches with that if cmc holds the ip um, because uh, they were kind of suggesting something like that if that happens because that is not in place so that did not happen but if cmc can hold the ip and you know gives some kind of a dummy left or a dev file that yeah. we work with at the end, the DRC is clean and you just put it in. I think that could work. <clears throat> okay. All these are very good idea. Um, so. There's another thing I wanted to share if uh, that's okay. That is, um, um, you know, especially going into uh, FinFET technology um, like 12 nanometer that um, GF is offering, uh, there's a big disconnect uh, between um, you know, the industry and the academics there, like uh, what it takes to do the complete four planning so that it doesn't come back as a rock, right? Uh, that gap, I think uh, when I was in my undergrad, CMC had some very good uh, latest and up-to-date material, but I think, um, for a fresh, I mean, I'm coming from the industry I've worked on FinFed myself, taped out. But without doing that, to just start off with the FinFed and expecting to actually go through, have a clean DRC and tape out is not going to happen. Yeah, we have some FinFed training, I think, in a couple of weeks. Um, 
but it's non-trivial to stage that because the uh, all of the IP uh, concerns around that technology. But uh, if you can make your way through all the NDAs and everything, uh, I believe the training is in mid-May, if I have that correctly. But you're absolutely right. The FinFET stuff is uh, is difficult to uh, to use. Great. Um, if we don't have any further questions from the audience, uh, I would like to give a last chance to our panelists with any closing remarks or any recommendation on how we are go going to organize our uh, next uh, next workshop. Any feedback is, is well appreciated. You yeah, seen one one thing that I typically encounter when working uh, a bit with industry funded projects is where's the line where this is considered too much industry and, and no, you should not be doing this on the CNC network versus yeah, this is classified as a valid R and D activity. Right? Most of the stuff we do, we go and and get a white tax or NSEC or OCI funds. So typically, there's that research component, but there is always that question, especially when it comes to using certain tools. Uh, uh, I'll leave it there and I'm looking for your comments on this. Are there any comments on uh, what uh, George was? George was breaking up from me. I didn't quite hear it. Maybe if you could repeat it, you're saying something yeah. to do with tools. So, so Peter, so one of the things that we encounter a lot is when we get uh, industry sponsored research. Right, and the question is usually, where is the line where this is considered no longer an R and D activity, and it's becoming more towards a product development activity, and thus we should not be doing that on the um, the CMC cloud, right? So lots of the stuff we're doing, we yeah. can still, yeah. in its essence, we are we're getting funding from NSERC, we're getting funding from from MyTechs yeah. or OCI. There's there's the papers coming out, but at the end of the day, companies take this and it becomes a couple of cases it became a very quickly a product action. Yeah. So where's where's the line? How do we draw the line and, and how do we navigate something like this? So that's a great question. And it varies by tool because it's often wrapped around the, the, the vendor agreement. So Cade Snaps as mentor, console, you know, they all have different views and the IP vendors as well. Um, it, but, but at CMC, we recognize that research takes place on a spectrum and it you know, from fundamental through to applied, especially in the engineering disciplines. Uh, so we want to support both. So we have a program to provide tools for research that's commercial oriented, this program called V, and we have a program for the academics. Um, and uh, generally, you know, if a company is going to benefit from this by it influencing their longer term R&D plans, but the primary objective is for a thesis or training of HQP, then you know it's okay to use the CMC tools for academics. Perfect. Yeah, that's that's perfect one. Yeah, that that makes it a bit easier because, yeah, if the work is related to a thesis, that's a clean line, clean cut for me. So that's that's a that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Now, good. Now it does vary by tool. I I know some of the vendors yeah. are more stricter, but um, others are not. So, you know, contact <clears> us if you want some detail around that. But we usually do that, but yeah, I've, I've noticed it's tool by tool and it's the, the line is becoming very blurry sometimes, <laughs> depending yeah. on the... Yeah. We have to be very, very careful because if we get Cadence or Synopsis or Mentor or Siemens, as they're called now, angry at us, they could mm -hmm. cut off the tools for all of Canada, Yeah. right? So we, yeah. uh, we treat this very carefully. <laughs> Um, another maybe a bit related question is, do we, or does CMC have any uh, limitations related to the uh, citizenship of the students involved in any of the projects? Do we know of any tools limiting that? I know some of them have export control goods related to certain countries. Does this extend to this? Like how does CMC navigate this? Sure, so that's a very touchy subject. Um, CMC has no restrictions whatsoever from the perspective of citizenship, but, the US government does. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter where you get the tool from. If you buy it from the vendor, if you get it from CMC, 
it doesn't matter where you get it from, the same US rules apply. And yes, there are restrictions, yeah. unfortunately. Um, and we're, we're navigating through those yeah. and um, they're not pleasant. Yeah, it's it's a bit tricky when putting certain students in certain projects and it's like, okay, we know we're gonna use this tool. So oops, yeah. what do we do then? And it's uh, yeah. um, very so, tricky. Yeah, so how, like the way it usually works, I just add a team member uh, to basically to my team on the CMC lists, yeah. but I don't get any red flags or anything related to what tools they can access, what they cannot access based on their citizenship. How do we navigate this? Um, we should probably take it offline, but generally uh, CMC is counting on the universities to put in those controls. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you'll see it in the language and the agreements and so on. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Our, our objective, by the way, is to make as much available as possible. So if we can, we would choose a technology that has the least restrictions yeah. and so on, because uh, I think it's uh, McGill University recently published something that showed that were students from 130 countries at McGill, and they were they were bragging about that on LinkedIn. So I can share it, but I mean that's wonderful, right? But we yeah. have to support that. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yes, yeah, if I may, um, yeah. I, I want uh, to bring up. Uh, you know, another, open, uh, another project that I think it should be well considered by CMC and even open hardware. Uh, I think uh, Rick is already aware of uh, Skywater 130 nanometer project. And uh, there are a lot of open source tools that, you know, remove all these restrictions that uh, you guys are mentioning. And uh, uh, I haven't seen any kind of, you know, activity from CMC or um, even, you know, universities here that, uh, promote these kind of activities with the open source tools, because it's not just, you know, uh, tools that are uh, open source and not pro is silicon proven, but actually like Google and other companies are supporting these projects uh, and helping people to tape out uh, uh, these projects. And um, I think it's uh, very valuable for at least Canadian universities and, you know, startups or um, everyone to know and work with these tools. Uh, uh, so we would have, you know, the experience. And it will remove all these restrictions with the, you know, CMS, with the cadence, uh, synopsis, and all these uh, proprietary uh, uh, tools. Rick, any comments? Yeah, so, yeah, sure. I'm uh, happy to chat about that. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with it. So if you're not familiar with Skywater, uh, that, that's the, uh, the old Cypress Fabs uh, in Minnesota. Um, and uh, so Skywater is a foundry, a pure plate foundry. Uh, company. Um, and of course, there's, uh, as you are probably all aware, a fair, fair amount of interest in onshoring foundry capabilities uh, by, by the US federal government. So they're getting plenty of attention these days. And uh, as, as uh, Hossein said, there's, there's been an initiative uh, with an open source PEK around uh, 130 nanometer node. So obviously, older technology, uh, but nonetheless, uh, can be quite useful and, and valuable. Um, and a whole raft of open source EDA tools uh, to, uh, to implement uh, those designs uh, that are you know, clearly less aggressive um, from, a, from a geometry standpoint and from a physical design standpoint. Um, and those are cool initiatives. The, um, the focus that we have, uh, so I'm, I'm, I think that's a very, very cool project. And uh, I, I'd love for a member company in the open hardware ecosystem to see that as high value for them and want to drive projects uh, inside the open hardware group. Um, and you know, CMC is a is a a strong platinum member of open hardware, so you know, you could be that company if that's what you wanted to uh, you know wanted to take on. But the way that we create projects, or the way that projects are created in the open hardware ecosystem, is through um, uh, member uh, member initiatives, right? Like it's not Rick doesn't decide or open hardware staff engineers. We don't decide what the projects are. The member companies decide. And uh, so far, no one has, has come knocking on the door of the 65 plus members and partners. No one's come knocking on the door saying, hey, Skywater 100, 130 nanometer, you know, open source PK. And, and wait for, you know, there's some, 
if your projects qualify, there's some free wafer starts that Google pays for, and there's a, there's a lot of initiative and momentum around the, this, this project. But uh, for me to do anything about it, it needs to come from a member who wants to say, take one of our existing cores and synthesize it into that library and build you know, the, the, the 32-bit four-stage core as an example in that flow with, with the uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. appro appropriate peripherals around it and that kind of stuff. So we'd, we'd be happy to have a project in the community that supported that, but it needs to come from a member organization, including any of the uh, universities, right? So a uh, university is a member too. So you, you, <laughs> Poly Montreal could decide, we want to push a project through on 130 nanometers at Skywater for whatever it is you're trying to research, right? So. I'll just make a brief comment too, Yassine. So yeah. open source is, is, is awesome. And, um, you know, CMC is a strong supporter and uh, Yassine's got a lot of open source that he's supporting on his uh, stack for AI. Uh, when it comes to uh, chip design tools, there's, there, there are some initiatives. Uh, we know some photonics users are uh, using something called K Layout, for example, for photonics that's uh, open source, uh, really available and everything. And yes, it does help a lot on the restrictions for access. Um, our engineers at CMC are super busy and we're trying to, uh, you know, we're spread pretty thin. So we'd have to have pretty reasonable, strong requests from industry for us to support the, uh, the open source chip design tools. You know, the AMDs and the, uh, the Huawei's and the TSMC's in Canada that are designing chips, if they were using those tools, we certainly would pay more attention to them. But we're also at the same time trying to introduce new chip technologies, you know, XFAB and, and, um, and others. So uh, Tower Jazz and so on. So, I mean, we can look again at the, the, those tools and so on. Um, the PDK support is difficult to find, right? The, the PDKs and the models and uh, so on for the devices and the processes and so on, but yeah. Great question, great answers. I, I, I agree with Peter. Uh, so in terms of this uh, machine learning uh, frameworks uh, that, that are open source, they are widely adopted, widely supported. So adopting them is, is, is very easy at CMC because we have strong uh, demand for them. And uh, for, for the chip design, it's, it's another story. So if there is strong interest, then, then we can consider it. Um, it's 4.50. Is there any uh, last question, last chance to ask questions from the audience, uh, last chance to ask questions from the panelists? OK, so with that, uh, I would like to conclude the, the workshop. Uh, very big thanks to our distinguished speakers uh, who made this workshop uh, a very, very uh, a good opportunity to learn and uh, explore collaborations and learn about the latest development in edge and cloud computing. <clears throat> Stay safe. Uh, this is going to be an annual event. Uh, we had to run this uh, virtually. Uh, I think it was very successful, but we really hope to see you in person next year. I'm really looking forward, really miss uh, meeting the researchers, uh, engaging in uh, very thoughtful conversations. Uh, the material is gonna be posted online. So uh, we will send you uh, an email confirming uh, where you can uh, uh, review the, the, the presentations and uh, you can also stay engaged with CMC. Thank you very much and have a great day.